Good evening and welcome. I am now going to call this meeting to order at 7.07 p.m. Welcome to the PBUSD board meeting. We have translation in Spanish. If you need that support, please see Urania Lopez. Bienvenidos a la reunión de la Junta Directiva de PBUSD. Disponemos traducción en español. Si necesita ese apoyo, consulte a Urania Lopez. This meeting will be live streamed and recorded. If someone would like to speak to an item on the agenda, they must complete a speaker card and submit it to Eva Renteria prior to the agenda item. Once an item has begun, cards will not be accepted for that item. Each speaker will have two minutes with a total time for public input on each agenda item to 30 minutes max. I also see a lot of new faces here tonight, so I want to take a moment to establish some ground rules. There may be differences of opinion, sometimes strong differences. Please give those speaking the same respect that you would like to see when you are speaking. This will allow everyone to be heard and the board to conduct its necessary business for the district. I also want to remind everyone of the adoption of the Governing Board of Education of PBUSD's established and adopted meeting norms um, from our previous meetings. I would also like to remind everyone that we do have a student trustee who is sitting up here with us as well. I will now move us to item 3.2, the Pledge of Allegiance, and I will ask Trustee Flores to lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance, please. Ready, salute. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. We'll now move to item 3.3, our superintendent comments. Um, but before we do that, I'm sorry, I do want to highlight what you are seeing on the jumbo screen right now. These are members of our students from our superintendent's advisory council um, who attended the Aptops Chamber Marketplace event. And they were providing information to the community about Measure M. Now I will, after that explanation, move us to 3.3, the superintendent comments. This is uh, where our superintendent of PBUSD schools, Dr. Heather Contreras, will make a few comments. So I want to give a shout out to our students who are at the marketplace this evening. The costumes they're wearing are part of our attendance campaign incentives. We call them our pumped up crew. And so when our schools hit different attendance markers, the pumped up crew goes out to the school and gives a party. And it's been successful. The students uh, were actually greeted. Um, the students Superintendent Advisory Council was actually greeted by the pumped up crew in a red uh, carpet welcome, which then later led to them wanting to be part of the crew themselves. So a little bit of fun happening uh, this week. So one of the things I'd like to showcase this evening as part of my superintendent's report is our public comment time. Um, I know that there has been some confusion, but also some um, input around what we're doing related to public comment as a school board. Um, I've shared before that we are trying to be our very best governance team possible, and that means that we look into and research best practices. And if we're doing something that's way out of line, we, we do want to change it. And so um, hearing the community, listening to the input around public comment led us to say, well, maybe we need to examine uh, some of the public comment uh, strategies or um, rules that other districts are doing in this surrounding area. So we did a little research study uh, to help inform what we're doing, and we researched 20 different districts. We looked at what their allocated public time was, as well as, as, well as their number of speaker minutes. Um, and I'd like to share that information with you, just uh, to help all of us understand what might be best at, or common practices. You could skip to that one. So public comment at board meetings, um, what the Ed Code states, as well as Brown Act, is that the board meetings need to provide an opportunity for the public to address the board on items of public interest within the board's jurisdiction. That's government code section 54954.3. For any item that's on the agenda, the public must have the opportunity to address the board prior to or during the board's consideration of the item. And at a regular meeting, the public's also permitted to comment on matters not on the agenda. 
The board is also authorized to set reasonable limits. So those are the time amounts of times. And I think that's something that we've all been struggling with, everybody from people attending here to the board. Like, what are reasonable amounts of time? What should we be doing? What does the public want? And so that is what really led to um, looking into what we should be doing. So one of the statements that is in uh, reasonable time limits is the suggestion of 20 minutes. And that is just taken from government code. You go to the next one too. So what we found out is we researched seven school districts in Santa Cruz County. We researched five districts in Monterey County. We looked at three districts in San Benito County. And then we also looked at five districts in the Bay Area and along the Central Coast. Um, what we found was that individual speaker time limits, the most common was three minutes. 12 districts had three minutes for speaker time. Uh, two districts allowed for two minutes, and one district allowed for one minute. Um, and that there was the clause in two districts that said it would be dependent on the number of speakers. So if there were 30 speakers, they would adjust that, which is something that this board has been doing as well. Um, and then there was one district that had some unclear guidance. They didn't really have uh, any guidance on that. There were also time limits um, by non-agendized items and then time limits by agendized items. And what those time limits were is three districts did 30 minutes, six districts did 20 minutes, and four districts did 15 minutes. And then a couple of districts didn't have a time limit per se, but just said it's dependent on the number of speakers. And then there were five districts whose limitations were a little bit unclear. Uh, so the most common that we found was three minutes per speaker and 20 minutes per item. Um, the next most common was three minutes per speaker and 15 minutes per item. And then we had three minutes per speaker, 30 minutes per item, and two minutes per speaker, 20 minutes per item. So what what we kind of found through that research is that I think we're in line with and aligned with what many common practices are uh, for, for public comment on both agendized and non-agendized um, comments. So I think we're heading in the right direction. Um, we do want to continue to listen to the community and to hear your input on things. Uh, that is important to us. And so we'll continue you know, researching things to make sure our practices are aligned. One area that uh, we had a little bit of confusion on for ourselves as well was, is it allowable for someone to speak on behalf of someone not present? And in the past, this district for many, many years has not allowed that. And then last week, we did have that happen where someone was allowed to speak on behalf of, of someone else. Um, it's, it's often hard in the moment to uh, adjust to different things that happen in a board meeting. And so the people who are helping to support and run the board meeting are trying to make the best decisions in the moment. And sometimes that can be difficult. Um, and I think that's a little bit of what happened last week. And so looking at our past practice of not allowing the donation of time from another person is the practice that we are going to now revert back to. So I wanted to explain that so that there's no other uh, confusion. The other thing, and we can close out this presentation, um, that's been really important to our board is our core values. And the core values are the values that are in our handbook. And we really believe as a board cover governance team as the administrators in the school district and teachers that I've talked to as well, um, and I've talked to a lot of them, that the core values are something that if we have um, our students engaged in and we're all trying to practice as a community that we can really have a powerful community. And so I'm gonna ask that we all collectively commit to embracing those core values in this boardroom and that even though I know we sometimes have disagreements and that there are feelings of decisions aren't being the best decisions made for our community, and that is absolutely fine to have those disagreements, um, but we ask that they're just done with respect, that the disagreements are done with respect on both ends, both from the governance team side, but also um, from the community. 
So I hope we're gonna have a great and productive board meeting going forward this evening. I thank you all for being here and uh, let's proceed. Thank you, Dr. Contreras. I will now move us to item 3.4, governing board comments, reports on standing committees and other comments. This is an opportunity for each board member to make a few comments. And we will start with our student trustee, Daniel Esquida. Thank you, President Acosta. This week, I had the opportunity to attend the candidate forum alongside trustee Adam Scow. It was a great event and allowed the community to hear and ask questions from and to the candidates directly. Yesterday, we kicked off the Superintendent Student Advisory Council meeting. It was super successful and various small group discussions were elaborating upon the challenges and successes within our district. Dr. Dr. Contreras has made it extremely clear that she's motivated to work with these students to address these concerns and eventually resolve them. And I'm extremely grateful for that. We will have five more meetings throughout this academic year and we will, con we will continue to strengthen our community and student collaboration. In addition to yesterday's Student Advisory Council meeting, I also hosted the Superintendent's Inner High Committee meeting with ASB students from Pajaro Valley, Watsonville, and Aptos High. Pajaro Valley hosted their first back-to-school rally this past Friday with a tropical theme. ASB students are proud to say that their school spirit has increased compared to last year and it will only continue to increase. The safety precautions at the football games have been extremely effective and students feel safe attending games. In regards to Pajaro Valley High's inability to host Friday night games due to the light situation, students have taken it upon themselves to conduct research about the regulations on the stadium lights and, and concluded that other schools have been able to receive lights even, even in special circumstances. Watsonville High students have been extremely active in preparing for homecoming. Their theme this year will be around the world and they have begun to start selling tickets for their upcom upcoming dance while also planning for upcoming rallies. Watsonville's homecoming parade will take place this upcoming Monday and students could not be more thrilled. Similar to Watsonville High, Aptos High has also begun its prep preparations for homecoming with its theme this year being game on. Each grade has been delegated jobs and roles for the upcoming parade and rally. Aptos will also be kicking off their student senate meetings in the next couple of weeks to gather student input. And in Aptos High's gas pipeline construction has been a hassle with water being shut off and sections of our parking lot being closed. Thank you. Thank you. We will now move to Trustee Bolano Scow. Thank you. Good evening, everybody, and to everybody watching. Uh, it's great to see everybody here. Thank you for that update, Trustee Esqueda. Another great update. I want to thank all the participants of the Sustainable Budget Committee who came uh, last week to the boardroom. We have a great mix of parents, our labor partners, and that the meetings are being uh, uh, aired publicly is very good, very transparent. I'm looking forward to seeing what comes out of that. Also attended the PV High, Watsonville High football game. It was a great display, especially for our band, which was amazing, marching the team out on the field, the color guard, the cheer was very, very impressive. It was a very positive vibe. Uh, I thank you, our superintendent, for being there. The vibe at PV High maybe has never been more positive. Our classified workers are very, very happy, and it was a very safe an enjoyable afternoon. Um, and we had some conversations about that, and we're like, well, what's PV High? And one of the issues, the remaining issues, is the, the need for lights in the winter. It's a really big hassle for a lot of our kids and our teams. And I have an environmental background. I know there's a way we can do that responsibly uh, and also make that fair for our teams there. Um, I want to, I'm excited about Measure M, and I know we're going to have some agenda items later on about making some progress at PV High. I also do want to explore our ability to have project labor agreements. I know, uh, and I'm talking to building trades about that, maybe getting some language. I know a lot of districts around here aren't doing that, but some in the Central Valley are, so I'm going to share that with the board and our superintendent when I get that. And uh, final thing about public comments, thank you for that presentation. It's my preference, and I know, and some agenda items, some issues are hotter than others. It's my preference that when possible, we, everybody who wants to speak, we allow to speak, and I, and I appreciate the report. Thank you. Thank you, Trustee Bolano Scout, Trustee DeSerpa. Thank you, I'll defer my comments tonight. Thank you, Trustee DeSerpa. Trustee Dr. Holm. It was um, just the agenda setting committee was the activity that I did in between the last meeting, and I think the agenda speaks for that in and of itself, so I'll leave it at that. Thank you, Trustee Dr. Holm. Trustee Flores. Good evening, everyone. Thank you for coming out tonight. Um, since the last board meeting, I did attend the intergovernmental meeting where I was very pleased to hear some talk about the PV um, walkway path project. So that was exciting to hear. And also, I attended our safety committee meeting. 
Um, and in that, I was excited to hear about some of the uh, de-escalation training and other training that our campus security is getting um, to keep our kids nice and safe. Um, I wanted to say thank you to all those who attended the sustainable budget meeting. Um, I also watched that online, so that was really nice to be able to have that open to the public. And thank you also to our PV, um, all of our PVUSD staff that's been attending our events and our sporting events, you know, keeping our students safe. I really enjoy seeing our teachers interacting with our students, you know, outside of the classroom. So I, I really um, appreciate that from our staff being able to come out. Um, and that's it for this evening. Thank you. Thank you, Trustee Flores. Trustee Vice President Soto. I'll withhold my comments tonight as well. Thank you. Thank you, Trustee Vice President Soto. And um, so I'm going to note that I attended two town halls for the city of Watsonville for District 7 and received a lot of feedback from the community regarding concerns about road safety and speeding vehicles throughout the district and more specifically around our school site, such as near McQuitty School. I also attended the Intergovernmental Committee meeting, um, which is supposed to be an intergovernmental meeting between PBUSD, the City of Watsonville, and both Monterey and Santa Cruz counties. Unfortunately, since the change in the elected leadership for Santa Cruz County, we have not had anyone from the elected officials or their staff show up at these meetings and be present. However, we at PBUSD had a good meeting with the City of Watsonville and we folded into the conversation some of the concerns around safer streets in the City of Watsonville, especially around our PBUSD school sites into that conversation. We will hopefully be hearing back from the City of Watsonville in the next few weeks about steps they are taking with concerns around speeding on streets and especially the concerns around streets near and to and from our PBUSD school sites. We also discussed with our community partners at the City of Watson about getting our next Mellow Center JPA committee meeting set up, and we are looking forward to getting that scheduled as soon as possible. And with that, I will now move us to item 3.5, and this will be presented by our PIO, Elise, Ms. Elicia Jimenez will present our Red Apple Awards to the recipients. We've already moved on to 3.5. We did not receive a speaker card from you, Mr. Webb, prior to that item. I put the card in. I, it, even I tapped Sylvester right on the shoulder. Told him the well, we would have had to have it at the beginning, and I didn't have it, and we've already moved on to 3.5. Well, I mean, it's, I can't help it. You got, it's not okay, like we've problems. moved on, Mr. Webb. Thank you. Ms. Jimenez, will you please start with 3.5? Thank you. Meeting. Can you pull up your, media, your uh, things again? Ms. Jimenez, Thank please you. start us so on 3.5. Thank you. Thank you, President Acosta. I have the honor of presenting hey. the Red Apple Awards. This is an opportunity for the Board of Education and the school district to acknowledge a certificated, a classified, and an administrative staff member who is nominated by their peers. Today, I have the honor of inviting Mr. Angel Rodriguez, staff accountant from the finance department as the classified uh, winner. Come on, please, up, Mr. Angel. Um, thank you. We're getting better with this process. Now I get to face the audience, which is very important. Thank you. Angel em embodies excellence. His knowledge and, sp and spreadsheet skills have been exemplified in the creation of so many wonderful tools and processes that are user-friendly to assist employees at all levels to gain knowledge and track finances. This in turn trickles down to the students to make sure that funds are maximized to better benefit them. I appreciate the time and dedication he has taken to create these tools for the betterment of PVUSD. Today, Angel Rodriguez is honored for embodying 
excellence. Thank you, Angel. Now I'd like to call forward Ms. Marta Flores, teacher at EA Hall Middle School. <laughs> Ms. Flores has been a compassionate, faithful, and integral member of the teaching community. Her values have allowed students to succeed in their academic and professional careers. Through the hard work and dedication to our community, she continues to inspire both the current and future leaders and professionals. Today we honor Ms. Flores for embodying integrity. Thank you, Ms. Flores. And now I'd like to call forward Dr. Jackie Medina, principal of Starlight Elementary. <laughs> Dr. Medina has great leadership skills. She's very supportive and cares for the students, families, and staff. She goes above and beyond on parent meetings and making sure we have great communication with our families. She has done an amazing job supporting the Emerald Lagasse Teaching Kitchen and Garden Project. Dr. Medina is an exceptional principal. Her work ethic, commitment, empathy, and support inspires the Starlight staff every day. Our Starlight community is very lucky and grateful to have the, a principal like her. And today we honor Dr. Medina for embodying unity. Thank you very much for the opportunity. All right, thank you, Ms. Jimenez, for that. I will now move us to item 4.1, the approval of the agenda. Can I have a motion to approve the agenda? Move to approve. I'll right. second. I have a first and a second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Any abstaining? That will carry 6-0-1. I'll now move us to item 5.1, approval of the September 11th, 2024 board meeting minutes. Can I have a motion? I'll make, make a motion. A, sorry, go ahead, Oscar. I'll make, a motion. I'll make a motion to approve. I'll second. I have a first and a second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any abstaining? Any opposing? That'll carry 601. Thank you. Do we? I will now move us to item 6.1 uh, action report on closed session. Are there any items to report from closed session? Yes, well, there are. Uh, as of tonight's meeting for closed session item 2.1, expulsion, 
under closed session agenda item 2.1 board voted 403 to suspend approve the recommendation from district administration for expulsion for the remainder of this semester for student number 3401514 closed session item 2.2 student support services referral Motion number one, closed session item 2.2, a move to approve the certificate of personal, rep personal report as presented by district administration on September 25th with 11 and 12 additional action items. I second. All those in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Any abstaining? I abstain. That will carry 5011. Motion number two, closed session item 2.3, I move to approve classified personnel report as presented by district administration on September 25th with 18 and 13 additional action items. Second. I'll second that. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Any abstaining? That'll carry 601. And we have an announcement or a couple announcements tonight. Uh, announcement number one, Supervisor Maintenance Operations, Richard L. Martinez. On behalf of our Superintendent District Administration, we're pleased to announce Mr. Martinez's prom promotion to Supervisor of Maintenance and Operations. Mr. Martinez has worked for, the, for PVUSD for eight years as a maintenance specialist with broad background in various trades, such as electrician, grounds, and custodial. His knowledge and understanding of the maintenance and operations systems of the district are an invaluable asset. Mr. Martinez has been involved with CSEA for the past six years and served on as CSA, CSEA leadership as president uh, for the past three years. This, works gives, this work gives him the unique, unique experience to move into a manager role for the district using his skills at problem solving, building relationships, and leading projects. Mr. Martinez served as president of the Wattsville Pony for 12 years and has coached high school football and baseball for 10 years. He cultivates productive working relationships and instills confidence and trust in those he works alongside, both at work and the community. We're proud to promote Mr. Martinez to our supervisor of maintenance operations, and he looks forward to serving the district, continue, continuing the good work of improving district facilities in his new role. Announcement number two. PBUSD is pleased to announce the selection of Denise Phillips Craig as the new principal of Hall District. Denise has been serving students since 2008 as both a teacher and administrator. She served as an elementary teacher at McQuitty and as an administrator in the PVUSD After School Extended Learning Program. For the last four years, she's been serving as the academic coordinator of Hall District. She obtained her bachelor's in arts and liberal studies from CSUMB and a master's degree in education administration from San Jose State. Ms. Phillips Craig brings her 13 years of experience in education to Hall District. These experiences will serve her well in her new position. And we are proud to welcome this highly accomplished educator to her new administrative role. Go Hawks. And last announcement, number three. PBUSD is pleased to announce selection of Isidro Rodriguez as a new assistant principal at PV High School. Cedro has been serving students since 1998 as a teacher at both the elementary and junior high school levels as a site principal and as a superintendent principal. He holds a BA of Arts in Liberal Studies from Fresno State and, her, and earned his administrative credential from Tulare County Office of Education. We're excited to welcome this highly qualified administrator to PV High and go Grizzlies. And congratulations to everybody on your promotions. Yes. All right, I will now move us to item 7.1, visitor non-agenda items. This is the time for opportunity for members of the public to address issues that are not on our agenda for this evening. Please know that the Brown Hack prohibits the board from engaging in discussion for non-agendized items. Do we have any public comments? Yes, we do, and I'll call you up at six at a time. Jovenes Vos. Brandon Dinitz, Sofia Gomez, Jessica Carrasco, and Valeria Flores.
I will be the one to break the ice. Um, Brandon Denise, the uh, PVFT, I think it's cute that we have these up, even though they don't reflect some of our board members here. So good evening and thank you to the two board members who emailed me regarding the cowardly decision to limit public comments to 20 minutes. What you are doing is attempting to limit public participation and sow division, and your divisive tactics will not work. That report was completely self-serving, which I find it interesting that the only time we put together reports is when they serve your interest. Um, historically, here in the Pajaro Valley Unified School District, we have uplifted all community voices. So why would we look to districts that are doing less and been like, well, we're in alignment with the people who are doing less than us. That's swell. No, it's not. Um, where am I? So it's shameful that you are trying to pit the community against ourselves and try to get this, well, who gets to speak and who doesn't. It's also shameful that after the SRO contract was renewed without the opportunity to provide a report on a program, um, and after, in the last meeting, discussing the possibility of coming to us with a report, you failed to do so, but you came with a report to limit public comments. Way to go, guys. Good job. Um, especially after the disgusting and vile comments from you, Oscar. So having um, to preemptively like place a blame if an incident were to happen to basically say the blood would be on the people's hands who are speaking against it, that's shameful and you should apologize. Again, your divisiveness will not work and the community is going to keep calling you out. And I for sure will not be stopping anytime soon. So let's open up the public comments to anyone who would like to speak and get rid of this cowardly time limit. We really should be uplifting all these voices. I think it's great to hear, like when I was a high school football player, damn, I loved those pregame meals, but I didn't know where they came from. So getting to hear those people speak, we should uplift them and stop this garbage. Good evening, everybody. My name is Cecilia Carrasco. I'm running for PVUSD Board Trustee Area 6, and I wanted to talk about ethnic studies. Ethnic studies has had a profound impact on my life, especially as I reflect on my experiences as, an, as a student at Aptos High School. Like many students of color, I faced racism and discrimination, but ethnic studies gave me a framework to understand these challenges. Instead of being angry or defeated, I learned about the history of social movements, about people who have faced similar struggles and fought for change. One of the most important things in ethnic studies has taught me is compassion. When we study the history, struggles, and triumphs of diverse communities, we learn to see the world through the eyes of others. We develop a deeper empathy for those who are different from us and recognize and share humanity in all of us. This understanding makes us not only better advocates, but also better neighbors and allies to one another. Compassion becomes the foundation of our work, guiding us as we fight for justice and equality. Ethnic studies also helped me realize that racism is not an isolated experience. It's part of a broader history that people have been working to address for generations. I discovered the power of education, civil engagement, and the importance of doing my own research. I learned that change doesn't just happen on its own. It requires active participation and organization. Because of this, I got involved in grassroots efforts that aim to uplift our community. For example, I started the Born and Raised in Watsonville Scholarship addressing the financial barriers many students from our area face. Additionally, I organized cultural, cultural art events allowing me to combat the negative stereotypes about Watsonville, showcasing our vibrant, hardworking, and multicultural community. Ethnic studies has given me the tools to understand my identity, fight for my community, and pass on those lessons to the next generation because I used to be a teacher here, but I left. It's more than just a course of study, it's a way of living, a way of contributing to the future, and a way of creating lasting change. But at its heart, it teaches us to lead with compassion and to seek justice for all. Thank you. Hello there. After recently watching a documentary based on this issue of people like you who want to take away our education that would help us learn about ourselves and background is actually ridiculous. It's really disturbing that you don't see why people who have 
People from like you who have not suffered through the hate we face every day just for our skin color and background and decide what we can and can't learn. You can't take away our education just for your own benefit. Me and a couple of my friends decided we want to fully dedicate this part of our day to fully speaking up for what's right. And it's been what, a year? You have been ignoring our voices and we will keep speaking up whether or not you decide to listen. This is absurd that you say we should hold respective meetings on both sides when you can't even hold up that end of the deal as seen from a couple minutes ago. Hypocritical, I say. <laughs> we need to bring back CRE. This is just watching this, like seeing all my friends going to these meetings is amazing. And seeing people like you who don't want to listen, don't want to hold up these respective quote unquote meetings again is just hilarious to me actually that you guys just don't want to listen and hold up your little end of the deal when you say you want it to be fair. It really isn't the way you guys are putting it. Hi, my name is Sofia Gomez, and I'm a proud student of PV High School. Uh, I had to rush out of for Gloria practice and Taekwondo to be here. This is tiring. This is draining. I will admit that, but I'm never backing down. You have a beautiful, attentive, loving, supportive, loud community. And what we're fighting for, CRE, Ethnic Studies, is good. Ethnic Studies teaches students about systems, culture, race. Isn't this basic stuff our youth should be aware of? Why would you deny this for your youth? Are you scared? Do better. Sign CRE. All right, next six, Bernie Gomez, Bill Beecher, Dr. Barraza, Isel Barraza, Max Barraza, and Eli Davies. Uh, saludos, buenas tardes, good, uh, good evening board. Bernie Gomez here. Um, <clears throat> you know, I look at these, uh, bullet points, you know, and, and I, you know, it's, it's this soft approach, you know, to try to silence the people, you know, try to put the blame on us, you know, when people are passionate about when we're speaking truth, you know. Uh, but what I see, you know, on, in this board is a lot of cognitive dissonance, a lot of implicit bias, explicit bias, complacency, you know what I'm saying? That's, that's it, you know, that's just what we see. And I'm not saying that that's who you are, right? But that's what you're showing. You know, this is about having, at the end of the day, we've, we've been advocating for the last year, the students have been advocating for the last years, teachers, students, right? Parents, uh, to have a conversation around CRE, right? Even if you're gonna vote it, struck it down, right? Strike it down or whatnot. Having palabra, right? Having that opportunity for dialogue, having that opportunity to Again, have that discussion around it. Even if you've made your minds up already about it, but you never provided that opportunity for folks, you know? You never, you never provided your staff to come forth with the evidence, right, that you say you have to strike down CRE based on this weaponized, uh, deliberate definition of anti-Semitism, you know? So I'll leave that at that, you know, bring back CRE. Um, the next thing I just want to echo the CRO contract, right? SRO contract, excuse me. Um, yeah, where's the report? You know what I'm saying? Like, you've, you, I'm, I'm guessing there's been a whole year of collection of data, right? You, ha you have people that are being paid to create these reports, you know what I'm saying? So, I mean, I don't know where, where is it, you know what I'm saying? Like, we need the sheriff's departments. Uh, gracias. little change of pace. I'm here to talk about the long-term long effects of COVID-19 on our district. The impacts were very simple. We had to go to online learning. Revenues that come in dropped. And then the revenues went up big time. 
Here's a graph showing you what happened. So for five or six years, it was pretty flat. Then it dropped, and then it went up $100 million, about 40% over what we had been getting. Then PVUSD committed the outstanding blunder that we hear about a lot from finance. Rather than treat that increase as one-time money, they used it to add staff, about 30, over 30%. Big-time blunder. So revenue drops, and PVUSD is now deficit spending. We saw it in the report last meeting. This shows numbers that were uh, presented, continuing on the graph. You can see that the spending now exceeds revenues. So California is running deficits. You've all heard about it. We can expect that PVUSD will expect to see further cuts in revenue. And so I've projected the dash line, what I think we'll see going back to the old numbers versus what you saw at the last meeting. So what to do? Well, we added staff. You got to reduce the staff. How else can you get your spending in line? With declining enrollment, you need to close classrooms. With declining enrollment, we need to close schools. Consequences of no actions, PVS still get into financial crisis like we did in 1990, 91. The state had to come in and take over. Class dismissed. Thank you. I'd like to announce the person who is pivotal in the recommendation of Dr. Alison Tentiago Cubales with her expertise. PVSD ended up consulting with CRE. Dr. Christine Sleeter is Professor Emerita in the School of Professional Studies, CSUMB. Dr. Sleeter has served as the Vice President of Division K, Teaching and Teacher Education of the American Education Research Association, and as the President of the National Association for Multicultural Education. Sleeter has authored, edited, and co-edited 17 books and over 100 articles. She has been honored for her work as the recipient of the American Educational Re Research Association Social Justice Award, the Division K Teaching and Teacher Education Legacy Award, this USU Monterey Bay President's Medal, the Chapman University Paulo Freire Education Project Social Justice Award, and the American Educational Research Association Special Interest Group Multicultural and Multi-Ethnic Education Lifetime Achievement Award. Dr. Sleeter is highly sought for her expertise regarding the research on the academic and social, social benefits of ethnic studies. Introducing Dr. Sleeter. Yes, and I am giving her my time. Um, I've known and worked with Dr. Allison Tintiago Cabalas of CRE since about 2010, when we were teaching connected courses in the EDD program at San Francisco State University. And since then, we've co-authored together, we've attended meetings together, um, and I say all of this because I want to emphasize that I know Allison very well. Um, I, and particularly her experience and knowledge in ethnic studies and classroom teaching. Dr. Tinto Cub Tintiago Cubales is, without a doubt, one of the best qualified and most knowledgeable professionals in the country, perhaps the best, for working with school districts in ethnic studies. She has a depth of knowledge that few can match, and she has many years' experience putting that knowledge into practice. She also has a depth of commitment and compassion that enables her to engage people in the process of learning to work with ethnic studies. So, quite frankly, I was shocked when I learned that her work was being derailed by allegations of anti-Semitism. In all the time I've worked with her, and it's been quite extensive, I have not seen any sign of anti-Semitism in her interactions with people in th or in things that she said or done. To compromise the district's work in ethnic studies is to do a disservice to the students of PVUSD. As you may be aware, the research is clear that ethnic studies benefits all students, and particularly students of color. There have been numerous studies on the impact of ethnic studies on students of color, and they support the academic as well as social benefits of ethnic studies. I've reviewed that research for the National Education Association, which makes the re my report available on its website. Website. 
Dr. Tintiago Kubalis is the best person I know who can help ensure that the students of PBSD benefit from a well-conceptualized and well-taught ethnic studies program. So I reiterate my support for her to work in this district. Thank you. Hello, board. It disappoints, but doesn't surprise me that this is my 11th statement addressing the lack of listening and even simple acknowledgement of the community. You know, when I saw that report on screen, I really wanted to believe just for one second that you were going to do something good for the community. And alas, no, of course not. This board has lost my trust. Most of you on this board, most notably Georgia Acosta and Oscar Soto, have done nothing for or become obstacles to the community. I can't rely on this board to represent me. The only person who I felt represented by during the last board meeting was Daniel Esqueda. <laughs> Yet, his concerns on the SROs were dismissed by the board, who voted 7-0 in favor of SROs. Most of this board has clearly demonstrated they don't care enough about us, the community, to act on our behalf. As a public servant, you are failing to do your job. The only alternative is to replace you, which is what we will do. Vote for Carol Turley in Area 2 and Gabriel Medina in Area 3. Thank you. My name is Ishel Barraza. I'm back again, skipping my folklorico class to come here. I'm falling behind in school, uh, in my schoolwork, to talk to you because it matters to me. And I stand here week after week for you to not even look at me. Do you even, so I want to ask, do you even know the community that you work for? Did you know it's a sign of disrespect in our culture to not look at people when you're talking, and they're talking? Acosta, I'm looking at you. You're sitting, staring at your computers, your phones, everywhere but the people who you're supposed to listen to. Look at me. Look at me. Look into my eyes. Unless you're too afraid of a ninth grader. I would comment on the positives, but what have you done so far? So the, you, th you said you think us students are spoiled little brats. Who's the one whining, though? Who's the one complaining about having to do their job? I'm wondering why it's so difficult to listen to the community you signed up to work for. You've also talked about following meeting norms. Is one of the meeting norms taking so many pictures in the middle of a meeting and taking up like half of the time that you could be using to listen to student voices? Bring back the RE. Right, next six, Omar Diekas. Christine Hong, Bobby Peltz, Takashi Misuno, Pam Sexton, Richard Martinez. Omar Diegues with Barrios Unidos. I find it very disrespectful to put up the, uh, these rules when, when uh, public comment is open. You know, what kind of message are you guys sending to your community? You know, what, what are you guys doing not listening to the community? I don't know if you guys noticed, but I wish you guys would have attended the candidate forum. The candidate forum and all our freedom schools that we are putting on, our group is growing, our community is coming out. And it's getting big, and our community is being aware of what's going on. And it's only going to be a matter of time when that community is going to come and show up in here. And you guys are going to have to face the community. You're facing the students and this group right here. But sooner, sooner or later, you're going to have to face the community that you guys work for. 
and it's very disrespectful that you guys put this up for the community. It's it's like what you get messages are you guys sending to us? You know, it's time to to like stand up and be a leader. You know, and 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 listen to the community and this report. You know, and I come with all due respects, but this report you guys did about looking into all these other districts. It doesn't matter what happens in other districts. It, what matters is what's happening in your community. You know, you need to look into your community and find out what's going on in your community because it doesn't matter what's happening in other communities. What matters is what's happening in our community. And this gentleman that didn't get a chance to speak, that's two meetings in a row. I've seen him put his card in. I don't know what's going on, where he got lost. You guys, are, you guys need to like look into your, uh, I don't know, Go back and, and, and look at how you guys are gonna handle things. But, you know, there's a storm coming and it's called El Movimiento. On Monday at the candidate forum that we organized, and we actually invited everyone who's up for um, an, an open office right now to come. Two of you chose not to come. Right, you couldn't even, like, the community has been coming here, you couldn't even come to the community. And I wanted to say that actually Trustee Scal divulged something very interesting. He spoke about having reviewed the evidence that exists about CRE and finding nothing that substantiates the false allegations of anti-Semitism that have been weaponized against ethnic studies. And what have you done in doing that? You have done a disservice to this entire community. This is a community that is almost 90% Latinx. And you've held up ethnic studies for this community? You know, we're doing freedom schools and we're organizing them around the cannery strikes of the mid 1980s. And there was a lesson that was gleaned from that, which was that even though Latinx and indigenous populations are the majority in Watsonville, they are ceaselessly minoritized by the power structures. And that is a lesson that still holds true today. Democracy isn't happening here. It sure as hell is not happening because of these kinds of um, principles of community. Democracy is happening here. It's happening in the Freedom School. We are bringing, actually, ethnic studies. What does it do? It insists on the fact that the classroom is not closed to the world but is responsive to the world in which we live. That should be something that actually governs everything that you do. Unfortunately, it's not. Uh, Bobby Pearls, Watsonville High. I'm here to speak on the CRE contract. It's been one year since the contract was not renewed and as promised, I'm still here. I told you I was not going to let this go. I have not forgotten, Trustee DeSerpa, how you said that TRE brought a pedagogy that you didn't even know what they were teaching, and that made you very uncomfortable. Well, you didn't know because you didn't do the research. And so my students came here to tell you exactly what they were learning. You might not have known what they were teaching then, but you know now. Your continued refusal to bring back the CRE contract is not some noble defense of the Jewish community. It's just being stubborn. I have not forgotten, Trustee Soto, how you said from, from a First Amendment point of view, everyone is entitled to their opinion, whether we agree with it or not. But since you made those comments, this board, with you as Vice President, has consistently sought to silence the community voices by cutting speaking time, by turning off microphones, and limiting total speakers. You and I have two very different opinions and definitions of freedom of speech. And I have not forgotten, Trustee Acosta, how you said you were disgusted that our district had any connection to CRE, while also saying that you fully support ethnic studies. But you have repeatedly shown that you don't support the ethnic studies teachers and you don't support the ethnic studies students. So what about ethnic studies exactly do you support? Yeah, I heard a great quote on Monday from James Baldwin, and I'm gonna use it here. I can't believe what you say because I see what you do. Trustee DeSerpa, Soto, and Acosta, 
One thing has become very clear to me over the past year of coming to every single one of these board meetings. None of you, and I mean none of you, are leaders. Leaders know how to admit they're wrong. Leaders know how to listen. And leaders know how to make people feel like they matter. This district would be so much better off without you. And I hope, I hope the people vote you out. Support ethnic studies. Bring back CRE. Konbanwa. Good evening. I'm Takashi, Area 2. And I spoke about generational trauma related to SRO issues in the last board meeting. And I came across indigenous people approach to generational trauma. I, I will quote, culture is one of the best ways to break out of the cycle of generational trauma. Often the loss of culture was the beginning of our trauma. And I recently, uh, recently had a chance to join an event at Esperanza Community Farm, which is located near pa uh, Palo Valley High School. The event was just to make homemade salsa. And one indigenous family was invited to do demonstration. And the family uh, immigrated from Oaxaca in Mexico. And the grandmother of the family shared her story, how to run to make salsa from uh, her grandmother and mother. And then her, oh, her, her daughter showed us how to make uh, their family's homemade salsa. And each participant uh, made salsa. And uh, I'm so, I was so impressed that the family, that family tasted the salsa which I made. And grandmother said to me through her son that, oh, it tastes good. <laughs> it was very spicy though. So I'd like to share my sal the salsa which I made for the first time with student trustee, Daniela. Please taste it. Very spicy. Hi, my name is Pam Sexton. I'm returning and I have such a, like my stomach is turning right now. Um, last meeting, my understanding is you said there would be a presentation about the SRO mm -hmm. situation. You said you cared about da data even though you voted to, to have this contract and the, the one with the sheriff without any data. You've gone against past decisions around the SRO contract and there's no presentation today. What, what does this mean? Like you really don't care about data. That is what you're showing. And to say that you do by, by this presentation, which, Thank you, Brandon. Um, yeah, it's it's such an affront that you would have that data and not information on SROs. And I've done some of the research on SROs, and you know it because I've shared that data with you. And there's there are serious concerns. And you said, we need to know what's going on in our district. We can't look at national data, which says that it often harms Students, it, it harms the learning environment. It is especially damaging for students of color, for students with disabilities, with LGBT community, trans students. You said, well, that's national. Let's look at the local data. Where is it? Yeah. Yeah. Bring back CRE. It's related to this, and please, everyone here, and this is to everyone, I hope that you attend the Rainbow Conference happening this Saturday at Watsonville High. I'm gonna be there, I hope you're all there. 
please spread the word. Yeah. Where's the data? Exactly. All right, my name is Richard Martinez. I'm a little different. I don't play victim. Second of all, I believe ethics studies is in play. We have teachers here that haven't been laid off or fired, so let's do the, fa the false narrative stuff needs to stop. So the contract is a different story. Understood. Hold on. Don't be rude. Second of all, it says right there, bring it back. That means it has left. Fact. Listen, stop that time. I didn't yell or say one word back there. Don't you interrupt me. It doesn't matter. Keep your opinions yourself. Second of all, for somebody last board meeting to talk about a child saying one murder, that's why I'm here today. That was rude. That was wrong. Lotus, that was wrong of you. One child or not, pray to God it was my child or anybody else's no or one yours. Said it was okay. Please do not say you that. said not it say was that one it was child. Okay. So stop. That's all it was. That's disgusting for you to say. Okay, once again, I coach baseball from kids Good for you. little. Good for you. I coach football. This is, hold on. This is public comics for the public and the board. No. I'm addressing everyone. If you want to talk to because outside, I'm happy to talk to you. That's fine. That's fine. But, but what I'm happy. saying is, Let's be right. Let's be respectful. Everyone talked about respect. And I was sitting back there just to come up here and talk about how life is, and I'm appreciative of this town. I've been there. I was a troublemaker, but I have improved. I want the best for everybody. I would never want to say it was only one child. There should be no child. That's all I got to say. Chris Webb. And Javier Andrade. Good evening. Uh, this, this past summer, Trustee De Serpa, you had said that um, this board did not treat Claudia well because of um, delaying their raises uh, for the cabinet. And I agree with you that the board didn't treat her well, but not because of that. At the time, she was relatively new to that position, so I felt like that was justified. Also, they, the cabinet at that time, somebody who's not here right now, committed a very terrible act of um, trying to reinterpret the contract and deny our PN days. I've spoken on this multiple times. Very serious issue. I don't under, I'm not sure if everybody grasped the multiple levels, levels of how wrong that was. Um, but I, I just want to point that out. And also, um, getting to this restricting comment business, um, this is getting pretty like flagrantly out of hand. Like to where at this point, I think you should, I don't even think we should wait for election. I think you should just resign, Trustee Acosta. This has been like multiple times. Um, at this point, you realize that you're basically out of respect. I have always just put the card there when you move the venue here, which it doesn't even have to be. And um, I, I don't approach the dais, but you're basically saying I got to approach the dais, hand it right to you so everybody can see that I did the comment. And also, you know, you guys talk about respect. Look at the way you're acting here. Like, I've always been respectful to you, and I, I, it's kind of insulting to hear this for me. Um, so I, I think, like, if have the values, but actually live them out. Like, this is, this is insulting. Um, also, I don't think there should be any talk about closures when we had money to attack the teachers. We had money to attack them in court. Um, we had money to spend on different PDs. We had money for a special board meeting at Seascape on short notice. We have a perfectly good boardroom across, the, across town. We could have saved money. So I don't want to hear any talk of like closures or anything like that until we save on where we can and then also make use of our capital assets to build revenue. My rugby team, 10 grand a year they spend on fields. There's teams around here. We know soccer teams would love to come into our facilities and pay money. Thank you.
Good evening, board, and uh, to my colleagues, I'm a little nervous talking up here because this is the first time I ever addressed the board. My name is Javier Andrade. I'm a current educator, and it's with a heavy heart that I speak to you all today. I'm here in hopes of support and immediate resolution regarding my son and daughter at Watsonville Charter School of the Arts. We have two beautiful children there attending, a seventh grader and a third grader. Over the past three years, my son has been a victim of targeted bullying and harassment. This bullying and harassment has been affecting him physically and emotionally. Please keep in mind that I've always immediately communicated all bullying concerns to the principal, Ms. Thomas. However, our concerns are always dismissed and no meaningful resolution is ever reached. I have escalated these concerns to the district and HR many times with the result being the same, nothing ever happens. Bullying concerns that have been so outright horrible. As a matter of fact, my son yesterday was a victim of assault and battery. At around 11.30 a.m., another student spit in my son's face for no reason. No reason. And when I spoke to Ms. Thomas about it, all she said was that the student was on a super short leash and that I needed to trust her process. A process that has failed my kids for years. I was forced to file a police report because she didn't want to provide an incident report at the school. That same day, the student who spat on my son's face was back in class with no remorse and in retaliation continued foul and threatening language towards my son. And there is today where the rest of the boys found out that there was a police report filed and they were making fun of him because he ratted on his classmate. Oh, and as they put it, he was a baby because we protect our kid. All of this is beginning to weigh way too much, not just on my kids, but on my family as well. Nothing stops this bully from bringing a weapon to school and causing harm to my kids. I'm sorry, but I'm not taking that risk anymore. I will consider not taking my kids to school. And as, as mentioned to an email sent to Georgia, Oscar, and Daniel on August 27, in which I, was never, I never received a response back, this is a call for help to end bullying at all schools, not just my son's school, and to all these kids deserve a safe space. And it breaks my heart to not see that. I hope we can discuss this further. I will send this letter to all of you in hopes that we find a resolution as soon as possible. Thank you. Thank you. We will now move to item eight, employee organizations comments. We will start with 8.1, PBFT, Pajaro Valley Federation of Teachers. Do we have any public speakers to this item? We have three. Can you call them, please? Chris Webb, Bobby Peltz, Bobby Marshall. We have moved on, Ms. Garrett. We are on 8.1, and we have called public speakers to that. Can we have our public speakers come up? Can you read those names again? Public education. Chris Webb, Bobby Peltz, Bobby Marsha saw all wish to speak on 8.1. I understand, sir. We are out of our time. We have 30 minutes for a public comment, and we are past that. So we are moved on to item 8.1. So we have public speakers. We, if, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, sir. We have moved on. You could put in a, a email to the superintendent in her office, but we have moved on to item 8.1. Okay, we will recess the meeting. The board is now going into recess until the public can get themselves under control. Thank you. This board means recess. My microphone, thank you. So I want to remind the public that this is a meeting of the Governing Board of Education of Pajaro Valley Unified School District. It is for the purpose of the board to hold the district's meet, business, conduct the district's business in public. Unruly conduct is not allowed at board meetings. I have given already, now this will be the second warning on this item. If I have to recess the meeting again, we will and we will clear the room.
All right, so we are on item eight. Employee organization comments. It's time we hear from our employee organizations. Each have five minutes. We will start with 8.1, Pajaro Valley Federation of Teachers. Do we have any public speakers to this item? Yes, we have three. Chris Webb, Bobby Peltz, and Bobby Marshesaw. We've called the public speakers now. Now is the time for them to come up and speak. What are the three public speakers again? I'm not, we're not going to engage in a back and forth dialogue, Ms. Vaquetta. So we have three public speakers. Chris Webb, Bobby Peltz, Bobby Marshesaw. Okay, those three public speakers, please come up. We're going to hear from the three public speakers, Ms. Vaquetta, if you could please step aside and allow our public to come up and speak. And then we will hear from you. Well, that is 8.1. We just need to hear from the public first. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Webb, you're up. Two minutes. So that's one of my concerns. I'm going to remind the members of the public that we will not have any further outbreaks. If we do, we will recess the meeting again, and we will clear the room. So there will be no more public outbreaks. Thank you.
passionate about this. Thank you. So they're just being denied the opportunity to actually make some positive change in their educational career. But I love their resiliency. Um, it's not cool to call out our students and our families and community that are supporting them uh, with um, a statement of that is the saying that there's a false narrative and point out to our core values for the board of being respectful when really a comment like that is just veiled gaslighting. Um, our students are here because they're beginning to practice what they're gonna be doing in their adult lives when they're out in the world. And that is advocating for what's right. <laughs> I wanna to speak to what a community member um, stated regarding uh, the amount of money spent on um, teachers. It's unfortunate that this community member has never seen the value of education, public education, or the education of our students in this community. But just so you know, um, just as a, um, some points of, of fact, um, as per your unaudited actuals from 2019-2020, just for teachers, 26% of the budget was um, for salaries. But then in 23-24, only 23% of the budget was for salaries. Um, and your amount of monies that you have, um, that you bring in, increase. But the amount of money spent on administration has consistently stayed the same. So <clears throat> I hope that when things are gonna be stated, um, that, they, that there is some, um, also some background uh, knowledge or information being shared. When it comes to the monies that come into our district, um, something that came in during COVID to talk about, to address the, the comment that the district instead during COVID and afterwards hired more teachers, well, yeah, uh, or not just teachers, but support staff, um, because we received a ton of money, ESSER funding. And that was actually, and, and um, Miguel Cardona, who is the, um, the Secretary of, of, uh, for Public Education at the federal level, um, he was very clear in saying that these ESSER funds was to go to staffing, to salaries. But yet, agenda item 9.9, 9.10, 9.11, 9.17, and 9.18, which are all construction projects, that's where our ESSER funds have gone. You want us to support Measure M, we want some great workplaces, um, some the facilities to be um, upgraded for sure, and we're gonna we're willing to support you as long as we get PLAs because labor supports labor. PLAs keep jobs here in our community. You can have apprenticeship programs. We have amazing CTE programs in our schools, and we can be utilizing the PLA 
with this measure M if you want our support. Um, because, yes, we do need some facilities, upgrades, but there needs to be some guarantees. Thank you. Moving to item 8.2, California School Employees Association, CSCA. Hello, everybody, Heather and trustees. So I have stepped down as of yesterday, but I'm still a member as of today. And unfortunately, Gus had to go past his bedtime. Therefore, I could not introduce him, but the new president of CSCA is Gus Paz. Um, he was my first VP. Um, he's gonna represent CSCA just fine and he will work with all of you guys. Um, as far as CSCA, everybody is happy they are working. Everyone's enjoying the kids. Everyone's enjoying their time at work. Um, I haven't heard about anybody waiting for the summertime yet, so it's a blessing. Normally, you hear one or two talk about, oh, I can't wait till summer. But right now, CSCA is looking good, moving forward, and being <coughs> That's all I have to say as far as CSCA. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. And now moving to 8.3, Communication Workers of America, CWA. This is our substitute teachers. Check, check. Good evening, board, Dr. Contreras and uh, President Acosta. Mike Floor here. I haven't addressed the board in the public session in a little while. Um, I had some family issues come up, and a few of you on the board know what those are. And last week, got a call again, why they wait till Wednesday night for these, this news to come. It kind of tilted me, and so I didn't stay for the board meeting. I was actually here waiting for it to start. So that aside, it was two years ago, it was one year ago tonight that I came and spoke for the first time to the board. It was September 27th last year. Um, I was very green. I had issues with what I saw as a clerical error in a pay reduction. Um, I made some requests to have that addressed. And in the years since, I've gotten nothing but support from this board, and especially when Dr. Contreras took over the reins from Mr. Shankman. Um, I've since become a union steward. I'm on the negotiating team. We have a seat at the interview panels now. I'm on the Sustainable Budget Committee that's meeting every other Wednesday, so all my Wednesday nights are taken for the rest of the year. I've committed to that. Um, it's all service-oriented work. I still haven't seen the increase in pay yet but we have a sunshine proposal that was accepted and voted in. And last week, you guys presented it back to us. So thank you very much for doing that. And I'm bummed that I wasn't here to hear that in person, but that doesn't change the fact that it was done. So I just want to thank this board for supporting CWA consistently throughout this year. And I would like to see this board continue as it is. I know that Dr. Holm, you're stepping away for other commitments, and you're the only board I've known since I started my work coming to board meetings. So I'd like to see it continue on. Um, and I'm not gonna talk about the CRE contract, I'm gonna talk about the CWA contract. Now that negotiations have formally opened up, I'm waiting for the meetings. I need to explain to our chief negotiator, Robert Longer, when the meetings are gonna be so he can clear his schedule. I have faith that that's gonna happen. And really nothing to complain about, nothing to bag on anybody about. I'm a little bit impatient, waiting patiently for the, the negotiation meetings to actually happen. And once they do, then maybe I'll have some things to talk about. But right now, I just appreciate the board. I appreciate being able to come up here. I appreciate the opportunity to nurture my public speaking skills. 
and all the consideration that I've been shown with campaign dinners, long conversations with a few of you, the, the monthly meeting with Dr. Contreras. It's a wonderful experience for me. And um, I think I've addressed everything I wanted to talk about. So I'm looking forward to the negotiations. I've said that a few times. So bring those on. We are ready. And thank you for your time tonight. Good night. Good night. Thank you, Mr. Floor. And now moving to 8.4, Pajaro Valley Association of Managers, Pavam. Do we have anyone here speaking on behalf of Pavam? All right, seeing none, I will now move us to item nine, our consent agenda. Consent items are uh, routine items that come before the board. Do we have any public speakers to consent agenda? Yes, we do. <clears throat> We have Marilyn Garrett, 9.3, Brendan Denise, 9.4, and then Marilyn again on 9.9. .9. Which one? This was 9.3. Okay. <clears throat> um, um, our current adopted elementary English language development curriculum is talking about that and English learner services. Um, it says, um, and I used to teach bilingual classes at MSD and Calabasas schools. And it says, specifically our students in the earliest stages of English proficiency development were not supported by the curriculum and supplemental materials. Connect from this to higher learning is a product specifically designed to support these students and supplement the adopted curriculum. This isn't specific. What, what is the product? And it says our EL services team have vetted the product and we now have sites eager to use it to support their students. It's not clear what the product is, but I can tell you when I talked, it, it just, this is not clear. This is supposed to be the detailed agenda. Is this more computer stuff, more Wi-Fi? When I taught, we had hands-on activities, like everyone making apple pie, or pumpkin pie, or someone can, everyone participated in involved reading, measurement, cooperation, enjoyment, if a child brought in a toad from the schoolyard, we wrote about it, read books. Can you be specific? What is this? You vetted the product. What is the product? Thank you, Marilyn. Say? I got a response, please. Thank you. For time purposes, you signed up for two agenda items. Do you want to go back to back, or do you want me to go and then you to go again? Oh, no, go ahead. Okay. Thank you. Bob. All right, well, what a night. You guys have sewed for yourself. Good job. How to get the cops here. Um, so I want to speak to item 9.4 because cognitive coaching, a contract for cognitive coaching for our coaches and administrators. What is that? And I bet you not a single one of you has the answer. So, you are all so quick to drop the CRE contract because the people bankrolling Georgia told you to. And just like the puppets some of you are, you follow their orders. If we want to talk about wasting money on ineffective programs, this contract here is an example. Can any of you tell us about this contract? Because it is the only one on the consent agenda item that does not have an attachment. 
If you look, every other item has an attachment or a cost associated. Go ahead, look at 9.4 right now if you have your agenda. There's nothing there. So you're going to rush something through and not give the community the chance to even know what it is. It's just some mysterious title, Cognitive Coaching. So I ask you to defer this item and explain what this is. Who would it benefit and how much would it cost? We know you don't like to do your jobs, but please defer this agenda item and explain to the public what is this cognitive coaching? Are you going to be training people to become Jedis? Like, are we going to be working on IQ? Like, what cognitive coaching? Please pull it so that we can hear this great response that I'm sure you have prepared. What number was it? 9.13. 9.9 9 is what you put in, Marilyn. Um, it was the one on fencing. Yes, that's... Okay. For Pajaro Middle School? Yes. Yes. Um, I'm wondering why there is so much fencing at the schools when I drive by, like, Bradley School. Fences all over. It gives me the sense of prisons. Everything's <coughs> fenced in. And if it's supposed to be for safety, that's questionable. Because I was thinking if there is some reason people have to leave the school quickly, they're going to be constricted through the small areas that aren't fenced. I remember when I taught from like 1981 to 2000, the schoolyards were open. Our public money paid for public education and children came and played freely on the playgrounds at the school. And I think that should be restored. I find it very disturbing to have fences all over. And I wonder how much money is involved for those building these fences. I often think of this quote about public relations industry. They say our communication is to manage perceptions, to motivate behavior, to create business results. These are business results, it appears, for certain interests. Thank you. All right, I will bring this now back to the board. Are there any items that the board wishes to defer? Uh, I'd like to defer a few, if that's okay. Uh, Trustee Bolano scow Yeah, 9.12, please. 9.14 and 9.4. I'd like to make a motion to approve the uh, consent agenda with those deferrals, please. Did All I right. say that right? 9.1, 9 9.2, 9 9.4, 9.14? 9 uh, 9.4, 9.12. Wait, oh, I'm sorry, 9.12, not 9. Yeah, 9.4. Not 9.1 and 9.2. So 9.4, 9.12, and 9.14? Please. Thank you for the clarification. Are there any other items that any other board member wishes to defer? I was also going to ask for those two, so I'll Which second. Which two? Uh, 9.12 and 9.14. 912 and 914. Anyone else? So, Trustee Bilanoska, I think you made a motion to approve the consent agenda with a deferring 9.4, 9.12, 9 9.14. Is that correct? Correct. Can I have a second? Second. Trustee Flores, second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any Aye. opposed? Any abstaining? That will carry 601. And now we will go to our deferred consent items with item 9.4 first. Can, can we just get a little clarification, a little more information about this, please? Thank you. Absolutely. Cognitive coaching is a coaching training um, that we are engaging in or hoping to engage in for our academic coordinators, for our directors, and for people who work directly with teachers supporting them in the coaching model. We do have those people at, 
engaging in a coaching model. Cognitive coaching is a type of coaching training that helps to um, elicit people's thoughts around something they just engaged in. So for instance, if I'm coaching someone in, in math who's instructing in math, rather than coming in and saying, hey, you need to do this, this, and this differently or better or whatever, it's a side-along approach to examining the actions that were just taken and refining them or um, based on your own self-cognition looking at how might we do things, how might you want to adjust or do things. And so it's really a training that focuses on a questioning routine and a reflection routine. Um, I've been trained in cognitive coaching. Uh, I went, it was a several week long process that I engaged in and I've done it actually multiple times over the course of my career. It is really a great um, methodology for coaching. So is it uh, particular to math or not just it's designed to uh, be for any content area and really just any, like even if I'm coaching a principal to help um, look at just what actions and decisions are making and what impact they have and then how might you uh, align that to the goals that you're trying to capture and how to be the most effective and the most imp impactful. Sounds good. Final question. Is there a, is there a, is this an outside consulting thing or is this in-house or has yeah, there's an outside consultant providing the training and I believe it's through the county office of education okay, okay. or in tandem with yeah okay for next time I just just because the question was there's no attachment here is that so is it, that's why I'm just asking for clarification on that I can provide if there's additional information no, that no, is needed we can no. provide that and it sounds good I just I'm yeah. just curious Uh, Are all your questions clarified? Yeah, so do, do we need a motion on this action, on this item, unless there's any other comments, is that how it works? If it's okay. gonna be approved. Okay, all right, uh, I'll make a motion to approve it. Thank you, Trustee Bolano scow Can I have a second? A second. I have a first and I have a second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Any abstaining? That'll carry 601. Now moving to item 9.12. Trustee Scow, I'll start with you since you brought it up and then we'll move to Trustee Flores. Thank you, this is um, pretty cool. We're talking about a feasibility study for here for Pajaro Valley High School Performing Arts Center and a pool. And it seems like a good idea to get on it sooner because in the past we've had problems with the co escalating costs of projects when we were delayed and delayed and delayed and that's what happened in the field last time. So I think I appreciate this coming. I wanted to highlight it because our students and our families at PV High have been asking us for a long time for this. And, and I wanna highlight that it's getting done. I also wanted to ask, uh, with respect to the theater, it's a really exciting opportunity. Uh, and I wanna ensure that our arts community, our teachers there, our arts community have uh, an ability to make some input into the theater. So we're getting the most out of it, because once we build it, it you know. And, um, and I th see it as an awesome community asset. So I just, I um, just wanna flag it, ask the question, we're, we're, there'll be, that'll be possible in that process that we'll have input into the, some of the designs yes. that we can ensure that we're meeting all of our arts needs yes. at that school. That will definitely be a part of the process. Thank you. Thank you. Trustee Bolanoscal, if you had all your questions clarified. Thank you. Trustee Flores. Okay, I also just wanted to highlight this um, project and say thank you. Um, I know we've had several students here asking for this. I was wondering if it was possible to add to this feasibility study. Um, I know lights at their stadium has been a request and in the past, our reasons for reasons for not having lights was the airport and uh, the salamander breeding and other issues. And I know now with technology, there are LED lights that will have very low to minimum light, light pollution. So I've seen these lights and they literally just would light up the football field. Beyond that is completely dark. So I don't see how that would upset the salamanders or hopefully not the airport. Uh, so I'm just wondering if that was something that could be added to that for them to look into. Um, Cause I see that, you know, that being also a request. That's it for me. Hi, uh, Jenny, MCBO. So we can certainly um, look into, um, we can engage on looking at the light study um, and we can bring that separately so to not hold up any of the start of these feasibility studies. 
Thank you. Thank you. Trustee Flores, does that clarify all your questions? Yes, it does. Yes. And as I think a few of us might, yeah, I'm going to go Trustee DeSerpa. <laughs> so the, pro the track and field at Pajaro Valley High School was held up for many years because we had an ongoing dispute with the um, Pilots Association at the airport. And they did not want us to build a track and field in that space. And there was years of negotiation around this. And we actually have a settlement, a, a legal settlement with them that we will never put lights at the field. So I would like us to please remember that and you, you can dig it out and take a look at it and run it by legal, but there's really important reasons why they didn't want lights there and it had to do with the planes taking off and landing at the airport that it would interfere with, with that um, process. So I just wanted to remind people that that was something that we entered into um, and we were able to get the field uh, accomplished. Thank you for, um, for sharing some of the historical context and we'll definitely um, engage with legal to, to find out some of that information. Thank you, Trustee DeSerpa. Trustee Bolanoscao? I'd like to make a motion to approve 9.12. Okay, um, and I was gonna elaborate something, but I have, a, I have your motion. Um, so I would just wanna echo, um, because Trustee DeSerpa and I were on the board and no. Yes, that's right. So I think Trustee DeSerpa and I were the only two um, board members remaining on this current board that were part of that and remember that pretty vividly. And I was just pretty much going to say what she said. So I'm just going to echo that, that uh, that legal binding agreement really needs to be looked at and then maybe brought back to board members so um, board members can be brought up to speed and enlightened on what those agreements were. and. Part of that settlement agreement to Deser Trustee DeSerpa's point was that was the only way we could get the track and field put in, and that was why the, the dis public decision process of the board at that time made the decision to do that because it was the only way we could even get the track and field. So please do look that, and you know you can also probably bring that in a board communication as well. It would be fine. Thank you. Okay, so I have a first from Trustee Bolano Scow. Can I have a second? This is for 9.12. Second. I got a first from Trustee Bolano Scow, second from Trustee Flores. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Any abstaining? That'll carry 601. Now we will move to item 9.14. This time we'll start with Trustee Flores because you both wanted, I'm just going to flip flop the table, the dais. Thank you. Yes, again, I just wanted to highlight this project. Um, I was very uh, excited to hear the city of Watsonville engaging with us in the, government, in the intergovernmental meeting uh, regarding this walkway because as Trustee um, Esqueda had mentioned, you know, we the traffic is really bad over there for our students. It it's, can be dangerous. And so I'm happy to see we're making movement on this. And um, that's all I wanted to say. Thank you. Thank you, Trustee Flores. Trustee Villano scow Yes, I also want to thank all of our uh, students who have written me and others about this issue for the past year at least. And I know it's been an issue since the inception of the school and Trustee Esqueda brought it to our attention. Um, I ran into a principal, Todd Wilson. He said, Adam, we're already on it. He, this project had been uh, contemplated a few years ago and it got held up for whatever reason. And he took it already to school site council. I think the school site council parents are very excited about this safety. Uh, is very important, and so I'm excited we can use our remaining Measure, measure L money to get this going. So I just wanted to thank our staff who are doing the work on this uh, at all levels uh, for making this happen, and, and uh, I think it's going to be a great thing for the school. So I'll make a motion to approve 9.14. I have a motion to approve. Do I have a second? Second. I have a first and a second. Does that take care of all your comments for both of you? Good. All right. So I have a first and a second. I'll call for the vote. All those in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Any abstaining? That'll carry 601. And now we will move to items 12, our action items. 12.1, approve a resolution proclaiming October as LGBTQ plus history month. This report will be presented by our interim director of federal and state and equity programs, Ms. McLean. Welcome. 
board trustees and board president and superintendent Contreras, Dr. Contreras. Tonight before you is a resolution to approve um, a resolution for proclaiming October as LGBTQ plus history month. We're hoping that you're going to approve this. I will read a couple portions of this resolution, not the whole thing. Um, October is National LGBTQ Plus History Month in 1994. Rodney Wilson, a high school teacher, believed the month should be dedicated to the celebration and teaching of gay and lesbian history and gathered our teachers and community leaders to support. They selected October because public schools are in session and existing LGBTQ plus traditions such as coming out day also occur during this month. I will uh, read a couple of these here. Uh, whereas Pajaro Valley Unified School District Board of Education believes that the rich variety and diversity of families and communities is one of our strengths and furthermore believes that a strong community consists of a supportive unit composed of various genders, orientations, cultures, races, and ethnicities. Whereas Pajaro Valley Unified School District Board of Education values honors and welcomes the diversity of our student body, our teachers, our staff, and administrators, including the diversity of sexual orientation and gender identity in our community. And whereas Pajaro Valley Unified School District Board of Education recognizes that we have students and staff at all grade levels and within the organization that are LGBTQ plus and or have LGBTQ plus family members, and they deserve to feel recognized and valued. And whereas Pajaro Valley Unified School District has, through our resolutions and our actions, made a commitment to achieving acceptance through fostering diversity and inclusion in our staff, our school population, and in our curriculum. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the Pajaro Valley Unified School District Board of Education celebrates the accomplishments of LGBTQ plus people in history encourages all schools to celebrate October as LGBTQ plus History Month and encourages teachers to teach lessons about LGBTQ plus history in their classrooms aligned with the state history framework and not just in October, but all year long. We request that you approve this resolution and I'm honored to be here um, bringing this forth to bring more sense of belonging and safety into our schools for all students. Thank you, Ms. McLean. Do we have any public speakers to this item? Yes, we have two. Bobby Marshall Saw and Eli Davies. Good evening again. Uh, as I I uh, do support this as a teacher and as a parent. I like to show up for this uh, item and take those hats off and put on my hat as a minister. As, uh, that's what I've done for the past 20 years uh, as well. And, um, you know, oftentimes this is something that's uh, seen as contrary to a lot of faith communities and, and a lot of loud voices. And I always want to thank you from those of us uh, within the faith community uh, who are affirming and just for creating a spa uh, safe space for our students. Uh, I studied sexuality and religion in seminary, uh, specifically that topic at uh, Pacific School of Religion. Um, and uh, it's really important that uh, we are engaged with this school board as well and just thanking you for uh, affirming those students and loving and making a safe space for as many, actually all students. Uh, it was just over a year ago that I want to mention too that Next Benedict was uh, killed on a campus in our country. Um, and that's the reason we need to continue to do these things, because as much as we continue to uh, affirm and do our best, it is still not uh, completely safe. And uh, the more we can do these things, the more we can create the world that we all want to live in. So thank you for doing that for myself and many of my interfaith colleagues. We appreciate it. And uh, thank you, students, for being who you are. Thank you. I'll bring this back to the board for questions, comments, and deliberation. Any deliberation from the board? Trustee Dr. Holm. Thank you. Um, I remember a conversation at Thanksgiving one year where a family member said to my cousin Brian's boyfriend, I don't, I don't mind gay people. I, I just can't support that lifestyle. And he responded, what part of my lifestyle is a problem where I go to the grocery store when I walk my dog? 
You know, I can't think of anything I do in public that you wouldn't do. And you know, this happened at a time where I was only out as bi to a few close friends. I definitely wasn't out uh, to my family. I was struggling with my identity, um, but this man's bravery was my light bulb moment that those of us in the queer community are just people. All the good, bad, and the ugly that comes with that. You know, my cousin passed away years ago, and I lost contact with the man who stayed by his side to the end. I don't know if they would have married. Um, this was before that was legal, so that wasn't an option. But I still remember his bravery in speaking his truth with love. He's part of my personal history. Acknowledging LGBTQ plus history is important because, you know, as Harvey Milk said, how can people change their minds about us if they don't know who we are? Our stories have always been part of history. Truly recognizing them is a step towards reconciling the threads that make up the beautiful tapestry of our community. And I would like to make a motion to approve. Thank you, Trustee Dr. Holm, for your comments and your motion. Any else? Oh, Trustee, student, student Trustee Daniel Esquita. Thank you for that explanation. I just wanted to um, echo Dr. Holm's comments, and I think we've been working as a district um, in terms of inclusivity, and I think this resolution just does that, and, you know, providing the context and history for those who have experienced prejudice and um, just hateful rhetoric for centuries. Um, it's nice that we have educators who are willing to share the facts and um, to show that, you know, love is love and um, people can just be accepted for who they are. Thank you. Thank you, student trustee Esquida. <laughs> trustee Bolano Scow. Yeah, thank you, Chrissy, for bringing this forward. And I and uh, thank everybody in our district who has shown a lot of leadership on this. I know we have a lot of active members of our PVUSD community who have made progress. Uh, and I want to give a shout out to Jen Salinas Holtz and the Safe Schools Project. They're hosting a rainbow conference this Saturday at Watsonville High School. Everybody's invited. It's uh, 9.30 a.m. to 2 p.m. and I'm planning to stop by. And I'll second the motion. Thank you, Trustee Bolano Scow. Anyone else? Trustee DeSerpa. Thank you. I just want to say that um, for many years I proudly marched with PBUSD in the Gay Pride Parade up in Santa Cruz. Um, this year I didn't because I was marching um, to honor Pat Dellen, who was, um, what's it called when you're the at the head of the parade? Marshall. The marshal. Yeah, she was honored as a grand marshal. So I marched with her this year, and then I doubled back and marched again with the Democrats. So um, I want to thank you, Chrissy, for all your work, um, and thank everybody in our district for making it a safe place for kids that are questioning their sexuality or might already know that they're gay, lesbian, or otherwise. So thank you. Thank you, Trustee DeSerpa. So we have a first and a second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any abstaining? Oh, I'm sorry, any no? I'm sorry, sorry. Any no, any abstaining? Okay, that will carry 601. Thank you, Ms. McLean. Uh, moving to item 12.2, resolution number 24-25-04, recognizing October 13th through the 19th, 2024, as the week of the school administrator. And this report will be presented by the superintendent of PVUSD schools, Dr. Heather Contreras. Good evening. We have another great resolution to present to you. <laughs> so this resolution is to honor the leaders um, of our school administration, our school administrators, during the week of October. I'm looking for the dates here. Um, this ha has been a recommendation for uh, 
different communities to take the time to honor the hardworking administrators we have in our district. So, whereas leadership matters for California's public education system and the more than six million students it serves, whereas school administrators are passionate, lifelong learners who believe in the value of quality public education, and whereas the title school administrator is a broad term used to define many education leadership posts, superintendents, assistant superintendents, principals, assistant principals, special education and adult education leaders, curriculum and assessment leaders, school business officials, classified education leaders, and other school district employees are considered administrators. And whereas providing quality service for student success is paramount for the profession, and whereas most school administrators began their careers as teachers, the average administrator has served in public education for more than a decade. Most of California's superintendents have served in education for more than 20 years, and such experience is beneficial in their work to effectively lead public education and improve student achievement. And whereas public schools operate with lean management systems, across the nation, public schools employ fewer managers and supervisors than most public and private sector industries, including transportation, food service, manufacturing, utilities, construction, publishing, and public administration. And whereas school leaders depend on a network of support from school communities, fellow administrators, teachers, parents, students, businesses, community members, board trustees, colleges, universities, community and faith-based organizations, elected officials, and district and county staff and resources to promote ongoing student achievement and school success. And whereas research shows great schools are led by great principals and great districts are led by great superintendents. These site leaders are supported by extensive administrative networks throughout the state. And whereas the state of California has declared the second full week of October as the week of the school administrator in education code 44015.1, and whereas the future of California's public education system depends upon the quality of its leadership now and therefore, be it resolved by the governing board of the Pajaro Valley Unified School District that all school leaders in Pajaro Valley Unified School District be commended for the contributions they make to successful student achievement. And we are asking to pass this resolution to honor our amazing administrators within the district. Thank you, Dr. Contreras. Do we have any public speakers to this item? Excuse me. Yes, uh, Brandon, Denise. Right, back in the saddle again. So, I've always found it infuriating when we pass we you um, pass hollow resolutions that are nothing more than lip service. Um, so that's what I'm speaking to. Um, these feelings bring me here to advocate for our administrators. Um, just like we have a shortage of qualified teachers, we also have a shortage of qualified administrators. We have some fantastic administrators in the district. I won't name names because then when you do, someone gets left out. So we have some fabulous uh, administrators in the district, and we have some administrators who are struggling. It has been 42 days since the start of the school year, and we have already had administrators resign. Why do you think that is? And how will this empty resolution help? So this district is far too hot, far too top heavy with too many administrators in the towers who are basically collecting a free check and having zero impact on our students, teachers, or administrators. Instead of supporting our administrators, you do things like split them between multiple school sites. How about you get some of the administrators out of the towers and out to the school sites where they can make a difference? Go ahead and pat yourself on the back for yet another empty resolution, pretend like you're doing something positive, and just sit there on your hands and watch as more administrators get burned out. Because the truth is that you either really don't care, or you care more about these empty self-serving words and you're just too incompetent to make the effort to support our administrators. So. Pair these empty words with some actions and support our school administrators because they are getting burned out and they are leaving the job. I'll bring this back to the board for questions, comments, and deliberation. Any deliberation from the board? Trustee Flores. 
I mentioned this early in my opening comments, and I'll just say it again. Um, thank you to all those admins that I see uh, working beyond the school day. Um, cabinet members saw them at um, events, and as well as teachers, and I just want to thank them for that. Thank you, Trustee Flores. Anyone else? Trustee DeSerpa? Our um, kids are at the center of everything that we do, our students. And um, schools can't run well without a wonderful leader. So I want to thank um, everybody in the administrative roles um, who support student achievement, student safety, their mental health, their ability to do sports and recreate. There's so many people that contribute to the wellness of our students. And so thank you to the cabinet sitting in front of me. Thank you. I, we really do appreciate your work. Thank you, Trustee DeSerpa. Anyone else? Trustee Dr. Holm. You know, over the last six years, I've had opportunities to speak to a lot of people across the district, you know, teachers, classified staff, admin as well. And I, I think about some of the conversations I've had with principals and cabinet members and other, you know, positions and just thinking about the conversations where they would kind of light up. And what was special was when I would talk to people about, you know, what did light them up and, what, you know, when they would talk about their work with making a difference in the community and the students. And you could see that excitement start to build. And getting to have those conversations, you know, getting insight on what drove people for their jobs. I, I encourage everybody to, to have those conversations. That, you know, it's like a lot of times, even if you think you know somebody's job, chances are you might not. And um, it's good to ask those questions. Thank you, Trustee Dr. Holm. Trustee Bolano Scout. Yeah, thank you for, uh, for all these comments. They're all important, and uh, administration is important. And we've seen when we have on the sites great administrators with the kind of culture they build, and we've seen the opposite. So to all those administrators who recognize, uh, as many of our teachers do, as our classified workers, our parents, we're all supposed to be on the same team. And when I hear one of our principals say that, it clicks and it gets people relaxed and like, okay, we're all focused moving together. And that's how it ought to work. And it gives us a chance to address our problems. And we have a lot of problems. And, but with that kind of attitude, that kind of a mission gives us a chance to fix them. And so, thank you. Um. Thank you, Trustee Bolano Scow. All right, can I have a motion? I'll make a motion. Thank you, Trustee Dr. Holm. Second. Second. Thank you, Trustee oh, Flores. sorry. She beat you. <laughs> I have a first and a second. All those in favor? Aye. Any opposed? <clears throat> Any abstaining? Okay, that will carry 601. Moving on to item 12.3, resolution number 24-25-05, our GAN limit, and this report will be presented by our CBO, Miss um, M. Good evening, Board of Trustees, President Acosta, Superintendent Dr. Contreras. My name is Jenny M, Chief Business Officer. And tonight I am bringing resolution 24-2505. This is our annual GAM limit um, approval. So starting off with our collective why, um, our vision is every student will graduate ready to share their unique skills and abilities and be a positive contributing member of their community and their world. And committed to cultivating a nurturing environment where every student thrives academically, socially, and emotionally, empowering them to flourish in a dynamic and evolving world. And this resolution, it aligns with our goal for to maintain a balanced budget while effectively maximizing all resources. So the history of the GAN limit. Um, so this was passed back in the 1970s. Um, it was designed to limit growth in government spending. Um, this was enacted as Proposition 4. 
It does not really impact our budget. What it does is it limits the growth in government spending um, in relation to population and inflation growth. So this is brought to you um, every September, um, and uh, it's for the approval of the GAN limit, which is required to establish our appropriations limit and make other necessary determinations for the following fiscal year, and certify that our GAN limit does not exceed the appropriations limits uh, imposed by Prop 4. Um, and uh, the GAN form was part of our unaudited actuals SACS financial report, and it showed that it, we do not uh, need an increase to our GAN appropriations limit for 23-24. Um, and this is the section of the SACS form that shows the calculation. So staff recommendation is to respectfully request the approval of resolution 23-2405, uh, for the GAN limit. Thank you. Thank you. And we do have a public speaker to this. Marilyn. This is item 12.3. Yes. We would like to see a nourishing environment uh, where every student will thrive emotionally, educationally, etc. So the question is are certain policies of the district or materials you're using causing children not to do well? And I have brought up before about wireless microwave technology. And I want to excerpt here and give you a copy. 10 reasons why handheld devices should be banned for children under the age of 12. And part of this quotes the American Academy of Pediatrics and the Canadian Society of Pediatrics state infants age zero to two should not have any exposure to technology. Three to five years be respect, respect, restricted to one hour per, today, per day and six to 18 years restricted to two hours per day. And then it goes on, and what are some of the problems with this technology? And you've got Wi-Fi, you've got broadband, kids with their cell phones. I would not be able to teach in this district today. Number one, rapid brain growth is interfered with. Delayed development from using wireless technology Epidemic of obesity. Children who are allowed to use a device in their bedrooms have a 30% increased incidence of obesity. Sleep deprivation. Mental illness. Big one. I will leave you with this. This should be removed from the schools so the children can go. I'll bring this back to the board for questions, comments, and deliberation. Any deliberation from the board? Seeing none, can I have a motion? Motion to approve. I have a first. I'll second. I have a first and a second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any abstaining? I'm sorry, any opposed? Jumping ahead tonight. Any abstaining? So, right, that will carry 601. Thank you. Moving on to item 12.4, discussion and action to determine whether to order an election or make a provisional board appointment. This report will be presented by Superintendent of PVUSD Schools, Dr. Contreras. Good, good evening again. Um, I'm waiting for that. Can you just scroll it up to the top of that one? Yeah. So, uh, we are, need to make a decision regarding how to fill our beloved Jen Holmes seat. 
Um, and we have a couple of options that we can explore. Uh, we can uh, choose to hold a special election or we can choose to fill the seat by appointment. <laughs> Sorry, we're having technical difficulties. No, 12.4. It's, it's up there. I saw, yeah, there you go. Yeah, just this. There you go. <laughs> uh, so like I said, we have the option under PVUSD's uh, circumstances of either ordering an election or making a provisional appointment to the vacancy. Uh, this follows Ed Code Section 5091 and our own board bylaws 9223. We have 60 days after a resignation to either order an election or to make the provisional appointment. Uh, the law doesn't specify any particular procedures for appointing a board member, but the bylaw does set forth steps that the board must take in order to complete this process. If the board does order an election, it has to adopt a resolution to do so, and the estimated cost of a special election is around $80,000. If the board chooses to make a provisional appointment, then the board must adopt a resolution and complete the steps as follows. Uh, we would advertise in the local media to solicit applications or nominations. Uh, we would, I would hold an information session for interested applicants. A committee consisting of less than a quorum of the board would ensure that applicants are eligible for the board membership. The committee shall announce the names of eligible candidates, and by eligible, in this case, we're really looking at the trustee area, that that, that person would represent that trustee area. Um, the board shall select the pro provisional appointee by a majority vote. I'm sorry, I skipped E. The board shall interview the candidates in a public meeting, accept oral and written public input, and going Back to G now, the interviews, input, and the vote must be held in open session. So within 10 days of the decision for the provisional appointment, if that's the decision that's made, the board will post notices of the actual vacancy or the filing of a deferred resignation and then the provisional appointment. And the notice shall be published in the local newspaper, which is pursuant to Government Code 6061, and posted in at least three public places within the district as follows. So the notice would be including the fact that the vacancy or the resignation has occurred, the date of the resignation, the name of the appointee, and then the date they were appointed, and a statement that unless a petition calling for a special election with a sufficient number of signatures is filed with the county superintendent within 30 days of the appointment, the appointment's effective and is no longer provisional. So if the board makes a provisional appointment and the voters in the district are not satisfied with that, a petition for special election could be circulated by registered voters. If the board fails to make a provisional appointment or order an election within 60 days, the county superintendent is required to make an election. So um, I think, Georgia, I'm going to put it to you now. Thank you, Dr. Contreras. Do we have any public speakers to this item? Yes, we have four. Nelly Vaquera, Bobby Marshall, Gabe Medina, Chris Webb. Uh, I called the county clerk's office um, just to verify like, what what these what can be um, done. Um, and according to them, the actual average cost was going to be somewhere between sixty to seventy thousand for um, a special election. And one of the reasons why I also called was because I wanted to understand more about that process um, because we. Um, a special election would allow the constituents of Area 7 to vote for their, their person. Um, it then, so then I have some questions for you all, which is, in this time um, since Dr. Holm has resigned, 
has any um, communication gone out to the, to the Area 7 constituents um, or even notification through the students that are at the school sites that she represents to those families to let them know, hey, as a, as a board, we're going to be discussing tonight how to move forward. So if you want to come and speak to have a, a voice in that process, since they are um, the constituents of, of that area, um, you know, I just am curious if that effort has been made, um, that communication has been made with those families and those students. Um, yeah, so then um, I just, it would be nice for the, the community to be able to elect their, um, their person. Thank you. Good evening again. Um, I wanted to come tonight to ask and advocate uh, that you strongly consider a special election for this seat. Uh, I know it costs some money. Um, however, it's democratic and democracy is worth the cost, in my opinion. Um, you know, when we, uh, when Trustee Bolaño Scow was uh, appointed last year, that made a lot of sense, right? We had just had an election. We had a very set board. We're about to head into an election where we've got three seats that are hotly contested right now. There's a lot going on. And so that could dramatically change what this board looks like. And so the most democratic way in that sort of situation feels like allowing that community to decide who sits in that seat. Um, so that's just my, my strong opinion. Um, I do want to ask if you're not going to do that. I do have questions and I tried to, to look at Ed code. I tried to send some emails and I couldn't quite parse it out. I don't know how the bylaws play into this, um, but I'd love some clarification on if it's 60 days from uh, the resignation date, the announcement, or is it from the vacation of the seat? Because uh, I, I saw it looked like Ed Code said from vacating was an option, but I don't know if our bylaws changed that. But if that is the case, if we waited 60 days from that, at least we'd see, I think this election is going to at least give some ideas of direction that the community at large is, is asking this board to go. If we have the exact same board, we have no issue and, and we, we go right on ahead as normal. Um, so I just think there's too much influx right now that in order to make this a board that's going to represent the community, it seems like the best way is with an election. If not, is it possible to appoint at least after this coming election? Those are things I'd love you to consider. And you know, I'll miss you, Dr. Holm, but we'll, uh, that'll be another meeting. Thanks. I'm going to use big words, Soto, so bear with me. Um, in light of the current vacancy, I urge you to call for an election rather than a provisional appointment. The right of constituents to choose their representative is essential to restoring public trust, which has been severely compromised. Recent evidence, as reported by Santa Cruz Sentinel and the Pajaronian, highlight this board's struggle with transparency and decision making. From mismanagement of funds to divisive resource allocation, the community has lost faith. And tonight, and tonight you walked out on two parents whose child has been bullied. Bullied. That is a shame. And that falls on you guys. Without any follow-up or meaningful action, why does it take so long to intervene with these students? It needs to be done quickly. This erosion of trust demands that you let the community decide their representative. While a special election may cost a bit, it's an investment in democracy and accountability. An appointment made behind closed doors will only deepen the perception of disconnection between this board and the community. To restore faith, give the people the power to choose their representative, someone who will be accountable, someone who will act swiftly and decisively when parents and students need help. Let the people decide. And I also want to introduce you to this young man right here, Soto. He lives in my area three. He is advocating for sidewalks. And I heard you got a phone call from Javier from the Las Lobos Market. I'm curious how that went. But this man, I want you to continue saying what you were saying because he walked I'm out sorry, the public comment on this item can only be on the agendized item, so. I have ADHD, so I need him to read something for I'm, me. If, I'm as sorry. long as it's on, it's on this item, otherwise it cannot be heard. Let the people decide. Thank you. Thank you. And you are disgusting, by the way. Thank you. <clears throat> mm -hmm. 
Um, I, I wasn't sure about this one, um, be partly because when Trustee Scott was appointed, I, I thought the process was good. <clears throat> Um, but since then, really in like the last 24 hours, my, my trust has been kind of compromised because you tell me integrity and these different values, but then I look at like how I was treated today um, and even at the last meeting. And then I look at even like how the, we, we messed with how Nellie was her time and all that. So there's a lot of untoward things where, where I just, I trust the voters. Okay, I, they elected home in the first place. I trust them more. Mm -hmm. um, really, this is not a, on the whole board. There's really only like a couple of you that are really hurting my trust, but um, I would prefer to see this go to the people. And also I think, um, yeah, yeah. I like to see it go to the people. Some things that I like about, or, and, and I say this, like I haven't always agreed with you, Dr. Holm. Like I, I think on the SRO issue, I think you got that wrong. I think on the PN day thing, you got that wrong. But I actually think everybody who voted on the PN day who voted against the teachers, everyone should answer for that at some point. Thank you, Trustee Scow, for at the candidate forum, you disclosed that you were the one who voted for us. So I appreciate you on that. But I think everyone should answer for that. So I, I would like an election on that. Also, um, when I reached out to you like a year ago about a student who was basically wrongfully convicted of um, like a, 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 mis a transgression, um, you kind of went with the district line, which was falsehoods about traditional Renaissance, the, the real Renaissance. And, and since then, I think the school's gone in a bad way. So I would like to see the people weigh in. I'd like to see deliberation on these issues. I want to thank you for your service, especially um, during COVID. I, I honestly feel that you kept me safe. You kept my students safe. You kept my family safe. And it was a very heated time. Also, I like just your manner and decorum overall. So I'm, I will appreciate you for that. Thank you. I'll bring this back to the board for questions, comments, and deliberation. Any deliberation from the board? Our student trustee. I was there. just wondering where the $80,000 would be coming from if a special election were to be held. That would come from the general fund. One second. Did that, was that your, the full extent of your questions? Okay. Trustee Dr. Holm. So when we had the vacated seat that we ended up filling with uh, Trustee Scow, um, I struggled with this question, you know, and one of the, th one of the things that I came to, one of the reasons why I supported the appointment was that in the end, the trustee area still has the option. Like if, if they do not like, if they do not, you know, approve of the appointment, they can petition to remove. And I, 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 I get the, the hesitation about that, but they do have that right. When we hear It would be incumbent on this board to choose wisely if they chose an appointment and to consider, you know, appropriate representation if they chose that route. So just something to consider. Thank you, Trustee Dr. Holm. Trustee Bolano Scal. Sorry. Thank you for that. Uh, that openness. Uh, uh, Dr. Holm, may I ask you a question? Were you opposed or unopposed in your last election, Dr. Holm? I was unopposed. I was appointed in lieu of election. And that, I think, is a little bit different in our cases here, where we, if we chose to make an appointment, the, we would be appointing somebody, unless I'm mistaken in, in my understanding, we'd be appointing somebody who got zero votes. And that is a little unsettling. Um, and that and the appointment, the term would go to the end of your term now, which is the end of 2026. Is that right? Is that my right? So that does give me, I think it's something that is weighing on me, and that's why I'm saying it. Not on either side, but something else to consider is that a special election at this point, it would not be, we're, at, we're gonna have a big November general election. It would be, 
can somebody help cl clarify when the special election would actually be? But I want to also, a few months afterwards, is that right? Do you mean if we choose If we to, chose to do a special election, when would that be? Uh, I think we still are beholden to the 60 days. I, I would need to look into that. What would it be? So, un okay, unfilled until March. So we'd have a special election in March, something like that. And special elections, for those who track elections, usually have horrible turnouts. And and so it, we've we've seen special elections in other jurisdictions where people won special elections and they lost when they ran in a regular election. And so it's also something to consider. But the fact that nobody ran against you last time and we would appoint somebody with who'd gotten zero votes does make me feel a little un, uneasy, uneasy about this in this case. But I just want to share those thoughts, and I'm open to hearing other thoughts. Thank you, Trustee Bolano Scow. Trustee Flores. Uh, yes, I was looking back at you know what we did. I mean, obviously, I was here when we with um, Trustee Bolano Scow, um, and I do believe that this board does have a history of doing a um, an appointment. Um, simply, also, you know, that the money comes into effect, but. Also, like what uh, Trustee Holm brought up, they do have that option of you know recalling if they are not happy with their choice. So they will have their voices heard should they want to go that route. Um, also, another thing that I was thinking about is you know sad to sad to think about, but there is a possibility we might have another vacant chair, and what we know. So now we're looking at possibly two having to fill two chairs. Up. I'm sorry. You know, Kim, <laughs> Trustee just Serpa, but should you, you know, be successful, we would have that open seat as well. Um, and so I'm more leaning towards uh, appointment and mostly because, you know, the, the district does have that, that chance to, um, within, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm reading it here within 60 days to, if they get the vote, if they get the signatures to overturn our decision, so. Thank you, Trustee Flores. Trustee Soto. Vice President Soto, sorry. So $80,000, that's a budgeted number, and it comes out of the general fund. What programs or what things can that affect? I mean, granted, this is granted. Granted, this is general fund. Again, we won't have outbursts from the public. Um, do, Jenny, I'm going to defer to you. I, I don't think we we haven't allocated or determined that amount right now, so I'm not sure where it would be. But Jenny you might be a better able to answer that question. So currently, um, that that is unbudgeted. So um, pending the decision tonight. Um, that 80,000 would potentially come out of our general fund, unrestricted um, fund balance. So essentially it could affect anything. And, that, and that's a big, big effect. Yes. Thank you, Trustee Vice President Soto. Trustee DeSerpa, I just wanna hear from everyone who hasn't spoken, thank you. Well, um, I, I said this at the last board meeting, but, um, and I think maybe you've heard me say this before, but. Uh, two electeds, two, more than two electeds have told me that the hardest position they ever held was that of a school board trustee. And I think all of us up here understand that. There's not a lot of people that want to do what we're doing. This is not a job. This is essentially a volunteer gig. And it's we do it because we care and we want to build something better for the kids and the families in the Pajaro Valley and all of the areas that we represent. So to the extent that I'm having trouble right now, when, when Jen and I have been reaching out to people in our areas, we can't find anyone who wants to do this job. So, um, you know, and, and being here tonight with the circus that was out here, who would want to do this? There's not a lot of people. 
Having said that, regarding my seat, I'm a winner either way because I either stay with you for two more years, um, and I'm honored to do that. Uh, if I'm if I end up being elected to the board of supervisors, then we'll have to find somebody for my seat as well. And I'll tell you, it's it's rough right now trying to find somebody who would be interested. What I'm interested in is stability for this district, support for our administration and our superintendent, and keeping kids firmly at the center of all decision making. It's not about adults, it's about the kids. So, um, so I'm fine with appointment if we can find excellent candidates who can continue to further the mission of this district. Keep us solvent, balance the budget, and keep kids at the center. Thank you. Thank you, Trustee DeSerpa, for your comments. They're appreciated. Trustee Bolanosco. Uh, another question, uh, if I may, should Trustee DeSerpa win her election, would it, and it was the preference of this board, understanding that Area 7 is up in, it's Area 1, is that right, Trustee DeSerpa, Area, Area 1, is there a way that the special, that both those seats could be on the same special election? Is that possible? And if we don't know, we could, uh, it's okay. We, we uh, timeline do not think so, because Trustee DeSerpa will be in her seat until January. I think, yeah, I'm sworn in January 6th, so I'm yes. not sure I'd probably relinquish the seat. Yeah. The day before, but couldn't you resign? Wouldn't would you resign that day, or would you resign? In well, December? Adam, I'll say it, that it worked out really well appointing you. Thank, well, You've thank been you. a great. <laughs> you are a great board member. The, the, yeah. Thank, thank. Well, thank you for saying that. The only and it just goes back to my original point. I had twenty four hundred votes, so there was something there. In this case, with Area Seven, Dr. Holm was unopposed, and there is something about d democracy is important to me, and. Uh, I just have a bit of trepidation about appointing somebody who got zero votes. And, and, I, and to, you, to the point you're saying, Trustee DeSerpa, if, if you're having a hard time finding people, a, a wider search giving as much public input on this as, as possible is, I think, a better thing. Trustee Dr. Holm. Oh, no. Oh, I'm so sorry. Okay. Trustee Flores. I have a question. If we were to do special election, and we had no candidates. Are we still responsible for putting up funds to do this? And just having said that, I mean, I know when I ran an election, it's, it's a lot of work. It is a lot of work. And so if we're having a hard time finding someone, you know, if they knew all they had to, like they had to just come and present themselves to us and, you know, be interviewed versus run a full election, I mean, that's something to think about. Did, I'm sorry, Dr. Kurtz, did you want to make a comment? No. no. Okay. Uh, okay. Um, did, 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 did your question get answered? Uh, it, it oh. We're still committed because we would still run it. Okay. So we would lose the 80000 Yes. Mike. Yeah. Okay. Any other deliberation from the board? Okay. Um, wow. So I've heard a lot of input and in taking that into consideration. Um, you know, in, in regards to the comment about how Trustee Dr. Holm ran unopposed two years ago, so there was zero votes for a candidate who didn't run against her, that would even be on the assumption that if let's say if we could all go back in a time machine and someone did had run against her and lost who knows that that person would even step up and want to do it today so that's kind of I think a bit of a mute point for me on on that note um, not only has this board had the history of appointing in lieu of an election uh, for fiscal solvency to the district um, with two years being left in the term, but other school boards throughout this county, as well as Cabrillo College, has done the same thing. This is not an uncommon practice. So my position tonight, um, taking all that into consideration, 
I think that the best thing for this district and the PVUSD community would be to do an appointment. I do have some questions that Dr. Contreras and I will together reach out to the board's legal counsel jointly to get some questions answered with regards to the 60 day. Because the language even here, it is vague. It talks about a resignation. I know you've had input from the superintendent of um, Santa Cruz County Schools, but I would also like additional input from our board's legal counsel, so you and I jointly will reach out to them to get that. Is And the question there is to make sure we're doing things correctly if the board votes to go in the, the direction of an appointment is the 60 day window. There is a question mark and questions that have come into us about is it the 60 days from the date of resignation? And maybe you could clarify for us when you filed that actual date with the county superintendent. I, I know when you and I talked, but it goes, he's going based off the date you sent him the letter. Or is the date, in fact, Thursday, October 10th, the day the seat actually becomes vacant? Because there is some vagueness there. And so if the board moves in the decision to do an appointment in lieu of an election, a special election, Dr. Contreras and I will jointly together reach out to the board's legal counsel and get the clarification from the board's legal counsel who, not that I'm saying that the county superintendent of schools is wrong, but we need that clarification from the board's legal counsel. And, and my letter was sent on Tuesday, September 3rd. Tuesday, September 3rd. So now we ever have that noted in the public record that that was the day that Dr. Trustee Dr. Holm gave her letter of resignation to superintendent of um, Santa Cruz County Schools. Okay, so, and we will follow up if that should be the direction. Okay, yeah, we can do that. Perfect. <laughs> Trustee Dr. Holm, would you like to add anything else? And thank you for the clarification to us about the official date. I hear what you're saying and what I have heard from my constituents in my area. They have asked me about, you know, is there somebody that you would be appointing? I haven't had anybody in my trustee area, anybody within my trustee area ask me to have them do a special election. It's like, if we did an appointment, I wouldn't be able to vote, right? If we had a special election, I would. But when I'm talking, when I'm, I'm still at this point in time, I am still representing my area. And, and I'm just, oh, I hear what you're saying, but I just think the better decision for the district right now is to start with the appointment and the people can still have a voice if they choose to. Thank you, Trustee Dr. Holm. And darn you. <laughs> darn her for resigning. Trustee DeSerpa. Do you need a motion? We don't have a motion on the floor yet, so if you'd like to present one. Uh, I'd like to make a motion uh, to appoint um, new school board trustees in, in lieu of an election. In lieu of election. I have a first. Second. I have a second. All those in favor? Oh, sorry. Excuse me. So, sir. Sorry. Trustee Vice President Soto. You know, getting back to the money, it's easy for the public to say, yeah, just spend the money. But they don't realize the effect it has on the district as a whole. You know, they, you know, they think that uh, they're spending uh, the district's money. It's actually the people's money, the taxpayers' money. So when they don't get a bus, they don't get a meal or a teacher for the year, you know, how do we explain that to them? Because we decided to to spend that money. And, and, that's, and that's the importance of being in this role. We can't have outbursts from the public. You know, that, that, that's just a, a clear demonstration of the ignorance in the community. So, so you know, we, we really need to think about that in committing you know, dollars to this versus common practice. 
So I'm, I'm having a hard time with spending the money, especially after the, the meetings that we've had in regards to budget and what's been presented to us and we know what's on the horizon. So we, we really can't afford to spend that money right now. Thank you, Trustee Vice President Soto. Trustee Bolano Scow. I'm, I'm just wondering, in light of these, some of these questions about timeline and stuff, Trustee DeSerpa, would might you be willing to wait until we get some answers on this? On Do we need to vote on this tonight? Is there any um, urgency? I, I think the that if there, there was to be an appointment, we have that 60-day timeline to look at, and the 60 days started when the resignation was submitted. And then, so we would push, if there was a decision. We're sure about that? It started on September 3rd. Yeah. She, sorry, I missed that. I, you want me to I thought it was That's, the date of her, resi her actual leaving. Our understanding seat. is that the time started when Jen put in her resignation. That's the guidance that we received. Um, I could definitely double check that. But, um, so the concern would be if, if we wait until the next board meeting because we have we do have to decide this in an open session um, that then it it just moves the timeline further out well I would say that given the fact that we have been turning over all the stones trying to find somebody who would be great on this board and we have yet to find that person I think then asking somebody to run an elect you know through an election process it, that's a big ask if we could find somebody who would be willing to serve, um, I think, and who's a quality person, I think that um, we should do an appointment. Just, you know, a point of order. Yes. The outbursts that continue, we've warned you multiple times. I would like to ask if um, he could leave now because yes. he's just continuing with the outbursts. Yes. We've had several incidents this evening, so Mr. Medina, we're going to have to ask you to leave the meeting now. Okay. So, just, Trustee Bolano scale. I just, I just want to finish my thought. I might be out outnumbered here, and I understand that. I'm not poop dismissing anybody's argument, and I and I think the points are all real. But um, I think it's worth putting out some more effort. I'm trying to put some more effort. I think we all know people who live in your area. And I know you're doing the best job you can representing your area. I'm not criti trying to criticize and anything you're saying or doing. But um, on principle here, I would like to think we'll have at least one good candidate or two good candidates who would hopefully want to come for an appointment. And I'd rather they run against each other than we just choose one. So uh, I'm going to vote against an appointment tonight. Okay, I haven't called for the vote yet. We, at the current point, we have a first and a second. So all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? I oppose. Any abstaining? So that will carry five, one, one. Now I'd like to call, I'm gonna call two points of order. I'd like to have recognition of the time and ask if someone would be willing to make a motion to extend the board's meeting and please do consider how many items we have left on the agenda and the number of disruptions we've had this evening and if they continue, we will recess again and have the room cleared because we've given the final calls for that. So can I have a motion to extend the meeting with consideration of all that? I'll make a motion to extend the meeting to 1230. Would you consider a little bit later than that, please? <laughs> I'll make a motion to extend the meeting to 1.30. Thank you, Trustee DeSerper. I appreciate that. So I have a Second. motion to extend the meeting till 1.30. Trustee DeSerper, confirming? Yes. And that's second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any Aye. opposed? Any abstaining? OK. So the meeting is now extended until 1.30 a.m. Mr. Medina, if you disrupt this meeting again, we will recess the meeting and we will clear the room until you leave. That is the final warning to you and to all members of the public because we have given numerous warnings this evening, more than we should have to give. 
Now, we will move to item 12.5, selection of a date for a special board meeting to evaluate the superintendent. This report will be presented by me, Board President Georgia Acosta. Um, so, we have um, received from our consultant firm uh, two dates that work with their um, schedule to hold our um, first meeting to discuss the evaluation process of our superintendent of PBUSD schools, uh, Dr. Contreras. The dates that we have been given at current point are Tuesday, October 15th at 6 p.m. or Thursday, October 17th at 6 p.m. Um, so with that, I am going to first call, do we have any public speakers to this item? We do not. We see none. I'm gonna bring it back to the board for questions, comments, and deliberation. Any deliberation from the board? Trustee Flores. I'm sorry, can you please repeat the dates? Sure. The, two, the times are the same times, 6 p.m., Tuesday, October 15th, or Thursday, October 17th. Georgia, oh, Trustee Acosta, sorry. Yes. I am open both days. I'll Thank you, Trustee Flores. I guess you don't. I, I will be abstaining from this. <laughs> you can come, what? Oh, you can watch publicly. Uh -huh. No. Oh, this is, okay. Uh, Tuesday, October 15th, Thursday, October 17th. Uh, prefer, preference for Tuesday, October 15th for the, uh, the evaluation. Is that what, is that what the, It's right? not an evaluation. It's to discuss the conversations with the consulting firm oh, yeah. about the evaluation process. Let's be very clear. It is not an evaluation right, of a that, superintendent. That's why I asked. That's why I asked. Tuesday, October 15th is uh, preferable for this trustee. Trustee DeSerpa, did you find anything on your calendar? <laughs> yeah. Uh, either day will work, I believe. Trustee Vice President Soto? Yeah, the 17th would work for me okay. Thursday. And looking at my schedule, Thursday, October 17th is the day that works for me. So I'm seeing that we have a majority of the board that is saying Thursday, October 17th at 6 p.m. So could I get a motion in favor of that? I'll make a motion to support for the 17th. All right. And I'll second that motion to support uh, Thursday, October 17th at 6 p.m. All those in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Any abstaining? So that is going to carry 5-1-1. Thank you, you all, for your consideration um, of that. Okay, moving on to... I'm sorry, that it was 12.5. Moving on to um, 13, our report and discussion items. Uh, we'll now go to 13.1, the board governance handbook. This item will be presented again by me, uh, board president, Georgia Acosta. So this evening, I would like to present another section of the newly developed board governance handbook. This handbook uh, was developed over the course of the summer of 2024 with the board, with the superintendent um, of PBUSD schools, Dr. Contreras, and our consulting firm. firm. Um, so for tonight's meeting, I will review the superintendent's responsibilities and protocols to facilitate governance leadership. So in our superintendent's responsibilities, the superintendent assists the board in carrying out its responsibilities in each of the job areas and leads the staff towards the accomplishment of the agreed upon district vision and goals. In looking at our protocols to facilitate governance leadership, we highlight the Brown Act and board meetings. We also highlight placement of items on the board agenda. We are also highlighting responding to board member requests for information or reports. 
We are also highlighting board superintendent relationship relations. We are also highlighting the annual evaluations and also highlighting, highlighting our multi-year and annual district goals, as well as highlighting communications and highlighting handling complaints, community concerns, additionally highlighting board leadership responsibility and board member school site visits. And I believe that's actually all um, site visits because we have more sites than just schools. Okay, um, so those are the, all the highlighted items being brought forward under this item this evening. Do we have any public speakers to this item? Yeah, Carol Turley, Marilyn Garrett, Brandon Denise, Omar Diakis, and uh, Dr. Barraza. May I start? Good evening, Carol Turley, candidate, trustee area two. I really appreciate that you've put this document together. I think it's a great guide for how board members work with staff and work within themselves. Two recommendations. There's an awful lot of power given to the president of the board. Whoever controls the agenda controls the conversation. I'd recommend at the end of every agenda there be a line item where board members can vote on items that they want to have on an agenda during the next three months. I'd also like to recommend that there be very tight controls on who can retain the services of an attorney and who can call the attorney and um, incur costs. Um, when you have one person who's able to hire an attorney that the rest of the board has never even met, that can be problematic. So those are my recommendations. Thank you. Do you have copies of this handbook available in paper? I'll make you one, Marilyn. Okay, because I'm not a computer person, and I, I would like to have that. Um, part of, and I think the district should provide that, um, part of the, I believe in democracy too, and democracy requires critique, listening, questioning. And your responsibility, you talked about board responsibility, is to listen to people who are here and respond to their needs. The circus you referred to was caused by an autocratic censorship of people's right to speak. It would not have happened had you listened to everybody, as they do at most meetings. The upset is your responsibility. You cause it. And I was appalled that parents were here to re report their child being bullied and were denied speaking. Censorship of someone pleading with you to protect their child from harm and you wouldn't listen. That's a form of bullying on your part in my consideration. And looking at, I assume this is part of your handbook, be present. You weren't present, you left. Listen with empathy, didn't. Very disturbing. Oh, oh man, this thing's not working. So can I get some, hold on. Can my time not start? This thing is like weird. I'm gonna have to hold it up here. So um, here we go again. You guys just like, Oscar, please look up the word um, hypocrite as you're walking away not being present because you just refer to the community as ignorant, but I believe it is you, sir, who is ignorant because we just made a big deal about $80,000 for the election uh, 
two weeks after we ramp through the SRO contract. That's not going to make anybody safer, but way to go. Also, we just heard a board member refer to this position as a volunteer gig. Is that what you call a gig that gives you health insurance and I'm pretty sure some stipends or two? But yeah, volunteer gig for you. Let's throw a pity party. So here we are to be patronized and read to while you all pat yourselves on the back. Do you realize that there are actual board policies and administrative regulations that you could be updating that would ensure that we are up to date and compliant with the evolving laws and regulations that govern us all? No, you don't, because you took a retreat to do something that chat GPT could have done like that. So, for example, AB 3216 was signed this week that will require districts to adopt cell phone policies by July 2026. And what our board has as board policy, I believe, oh, this one is 5131, as it relates to smartphone use. Students may possess or use on school campus personal electronic signaling devices, including but not limited to pagers, beepers, cellular slash digital telephones, as well as other mobile communication devices, blah, 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 as long as they do not disrupt the educational programs or school activity and are not used for illegal or uneth unethical activities. So your board policy still mentions pagers, beepers. What kids are bringing pagers and beepers to school? But you guys go on a retreat and you craft this policy that you read to us and you patronize us while you go run and hide and then call the police and then call us ignorant and then leave. But the policies that govern this district on cell phones still reference pagers and beepers. Our students don't have no, no clue what a pager is, but our policy addresses pagers and beepers. Let's go. I will bring this back to the board for questions, comments, and deliberation at this time. Any deliberation from the board? Seeing none, we will move to report and discussion item 13.2. This is a, a report on our sustainable budget team, and this report will be presented by our superintendent of PVSD schools, Dr. Contreras, and our CBO, Ms. Good evening. So we held our first sustainable budget team meeting last Wednesday from 6 to 8. We have 24 people who are on that committee. 12 of the committee members are parents. We did a random uh, drawing to ensure that it was a transparent process and um, that we didn't select certain people, um, and that was a successful way to do that from what we heard from others. We have two people who represent our community partners in education who were present at the meeting, and that was also a random drawing because we had more applicants than spots. And then we have 10 people who represent our labor partners, including um, district office management. Uh, during the meeting, we the biggest pieces that we accomplished were coming together as a team uh, and what our goals were. And so I'm going to show you just briefly the presentation that we used um, as a part of the transparent process we're trying to build in for the budget team. We also said that at every single board meeting going forward, we'd, we would do a report out on what was accomplished at the sustainable budget team meeting. And we will go, yeah, keep going. I'll go back. Um, so this is the list of the people who are a part of the sustainable budget team. So you see their names, the, the um, grade span that they represent. So elementary parents, middle school parents, and high school parents, uh, as well as uh, who was represented from our community partners, our labor partners, and district office leadership. And this is in alignment as we presented to our sustainable budget team. This is the actual presentation that they saw in alignment with our district goals as they currently exist in our board policy. They're also, we are aligning with our LCAP and ensuring that whatever decisions the budget team recommends that they are aligned with the LCAP goals of our district. And so we shared that with the team as well. 
We framed the agenda with the team uh, under why now, why are we doing this now? Um, and that was part of the presentation. We created team norms so that we all had agreement on how we would engage and those uh, team norms were created by the 24 people on the sustainable budget team. And then we are using a, a seven step problem solving model for this. And so we started with creating a problem statement. The problem statement was designed in small groups and Jenny and I will be working to synthesize what the small groups came up with um, to have a problem statement that resent, represents all of the thinking of each of the small groups. And then we uh, shared kind of the roadmap of what we had designed for the sustainable budget team. We shared with them our declining enrollment. This is data that, that you have seen in your special uh, budget study session, so I'm not going to spend a lot of time on that. Um, and we sh we've, you've seen this graph, we shared this with the sustainable budget team as well. We looked at our revenue projections with our adopted budget and uh, the deficits that we see happening um, now and going forward in our out years. That, and Jenny has been messaging this to you as a board for several months now. And then we highlighted the purpose of the sustainable budget team, that the sustainable budget team is existing to look at collective recommendations that the team can make to the board for consideration of how we are ensuring fiscal solvency for our district. And then we outlined core values for the allocation of resources. And we highlighted with the sustainable budget team that all of our decisions needed to stay student-centered, that we needed to keep in mind ensuring equity and access, that we wanted to ensure we were always prioritizing our core educational goals through the LCAP, and that we also considered um, decisions that had a long-term educational investments and were promising practices. So we did co-create the norms for engagement that, that we wanted to believe in and we showed them these norms as examples. Um, some of the norms are norms from within the district and we also showed examples of norms from other districts as well. And then we set to the work of working in small teams to brainstorm what were the seven or eight um, norms that we wanted to uh, adhere to as we go forward as a team. And so this is an example of the posters that were created. We used a process very similar to processes we've used as a governance team where the thinking was very visible. People worked in small groups and used large post-it papers to demonstrate here's what we were thinking. And then the team went around and you'll see the little stars um, on the presentation that if something really resonated with them, they marked it with a star so that we could start to see how we were beginning to norm as a sustainable budget team. Uh, so these are, this is another example of some of the thoughts that the sustainable budget team engaged in and another example as well. And so once we collected all of these, we went to um, a fist to five process. How much do you agree with whatever it is and um, what things do you definitely don't want to see as a norm? And so once we had done that, you can see our bolded statements are the norms that the group agreed to um, to work under as we meet in our subsequent Wednesday meetings. And then we worked from a problem statement. This was an example that uh, we gave them to work off of. And so the group um, went and uh, started in their small groups by creating problem statements. And here's some examples of the problem statements that um, the group came up with. Our next meeting will launch with, here's the problem statement we were able to craft uh, with a combination of all of the problem statements that were developed that evening. So words that stood out in this group um, as we, we debriefed it with them were to ensure continued academic success, to look at how we could scale our services and maximize our resources. Uh, we saw words reprioritize come up. One of my favorites, reimagine. 
um, that a catalyst is declining enrollment was a statement that everyone really liked. How do we maintain fiscal solvency while maintaining high quality? That was also uh, one that made it to the top. Uh, equitably came up many times as did transparency. So we talked about how we would reach consensus that as we made recommendations that will come before the board and we're hoping December or January that we would be using a consensus um, process and had the agreement that reaching consensus doesn't always mean everyone gets what they want, but that we could agree to it and that the majority um, believe in the recommendations going forward. This is the seven step problem solving model that we're using. We celebrated ourselves at the end of the night because we said we, we accomplished step number one. We defined the problem. Uh, step number two will be gathering and analyzing information and data. Um, step number three will be to analyze what are some of the potential causes of different things that we're seeing. Uh, identify possible and plausible solutions select and refine the best consensus recommendations would be step number five. And then step number six and step number seven would belong to the staff. And that would be that once the recommendations were made and presented to the Board of Education, that we would look towards how are we developing a communication plan of what those next step actions are and how do we develop that action plan all the way from implementation to at the end evaluation. Did it work and accomplish what we needed it to do? We also talk to them about making decisions that keep in mind effort versus value. That as we look at different solutions that we might brainstorm and come up with, we may come up with things that just are not plausible. And how do we um, take into consideration what is plausible, what is something that has high value for the amount of effort. Um, and then we also talked about the role of the staff in, sustain, in the sustainable budget team. That Jenny and I, our role in that uh, process is to help to facilitate, to bring information to the team so that they can have everything that the team might need to make decisions um, and that we would be assisting in those ways. So we looked at our timeline. Our timeline that is, has been developed is in September through October, and this, this is the timeline for the sustainable budget team. We would review the district's instructional programs, their budgets, the professional guidance documents, and then brainstorm ideas. In November, we would work to start narrowing down some of our highest potential ideas using data to justify how feasible those ideas are. And then finally in December, look at finalizing the set of recommendations and strategies to come to a consensus. One thing we did highlight to the sustainable budget team is their task with making a recommendation to the school board. We did say that does not mean that those recommendations would be um, taken by the school board. That is still the school board of education's um, decision. And so our next uh, team meeting will be 10 to October 2nd, next Wednesday. During that meeting, we will have a presentation on the budget to the team so that the team can have a deeper understanding of what we're looking at. That budget presentation will be done by Scott Siegel from Leaning Forward, um, one of the consultants from the group we've been working for, working with um, on our board governance document. Um, he'll present and have a Q&A, and it will be the same presentation that the board heard in the special study session on budget. Our upcoming topics following that include looking at equity impacts of the decisions that we make and the, um, and the different services we provide to our students. We'll examine contracts and partnerships that we have through, with our different community partners. Uh, we will look at staffing ratios and how we're staffed across the district, not just in classrooms, but how we staff a school site. We'll look at our district programming. What types of programming are we providing for students that we might want to analyze? We'll look at how we attract and retain our students and attract and retain our staff. Um, and then we'll look at the organization of our schools. What's the health of our buildings? What is the capacity of our different schools? And those types of considerations. 
that was, in a nutshell, our presentation with our sustainable budget team. It was really a great evening. I know Jenny and I left feeling um, like the team was very engaged. They um, really see, I think, a vision for the importance of the role that they will be playing in that. Um, Jenny, I don't know if you want to kind of give some input on what, what you thought of the sustainable budget team as our first meeting. And I agree with uh, Dr. Contreras that I think um, it was very, very important to get all of the different community input. Um, we got some really, really great insights already that I think is going to help shape the future of our district. Um, and it was just really great to see the collaboration, I think, across, across the board. Um, and one thing that we wanted to kind of highlight is the, uh, the central sustainable budget team. So they are working in conjunction with the community that they're representing. So all of the parents they're representing and, and they're getting input then from all of the school site councils, the parents in the community, um, DLAC, DAC, um, principals are getting feedback from their other principal colleagues. Um, teachers classified from all of our staff. And so it's meant to be a continual flow of information from the sustainable budget team um, back out to our school community and then uh, input from our community back to the team. So we're hoping that we'll be able to develop what that process looks like um, more at the next meeting as well. And additionally, uh, these meetings are being live streamed and then recorded and they are up on the same YouTube channel that we use for our board meetings. So we really, and we tried to get a process going so that um, people's discussions could also be heard live. Uh, and we're working to drop some microphones down into the ceiling so that we have a better reception uh, for the conversations to be heard going forward. We're excited about that. Thank you, Dr. Chers and um, Ms. M. Do we have any public speakers to this item? We do not. See none, I'll bring it back to the board uh, for questions, comments, and deliberation. Any deliberation from the board? Trustee Flores. Can you bring up that slide that has like the, the committee members? I was going to ask the one same of the thing. first ones. Yeah. It, it's not included on the um, slide deck. Oh, it's not? Oh, where was it? Oh, I thought it was one of the first pages. I think it might be that one. On nope. Heather. This one. So, you know, Jenny M mentioned, you know, we have our family representatives, our community, our labor, um, and we tried to keep it very um, rounded. One thing that I did notice, and hopefully it doesn't, and I mean, I don't know, I don't know that it would really make a difference, but I did notice quite a few of our parents are employees, specifically teachers. Um, so, yeah, I just wanted to, I don't know if anyone else noticed that in the meeting, but I, I did notice that. Yeah, we noticed that as well, and part of our process was we, we sent out applications to every person in the district and community partners as well to apply and what they would apply under, and so it was a parent, an elementary parent, a middle school. We did not discriminate that, oh wait, and you're an employee, so so you can't. Um, that was something that we didn't do. Trustee Flores, it, is that it? For now? Okay, Trustee DeSerpa. It would be helpful um, to know what part of the county these people are from. I'd like all three uh, regions to be equitably represented, so I can't tell which elementary schools, which middle schools, or which high schools these people are from. We can definitely include that in a future slide, and since we'll be talking sustainable budget team at every board meeting, that will be an easy fix. Trustee DeServe, is that all? Thank you. Trustee Bolano scow Yes, thank you for this uh, presentation, and for everybody who's serving, this is pretty, uh, this is very important. Um, I don't know if it's exciting, but it's important. And uh, I guess my first question is, is this only going to be regarding the general fund, or are we also going to be doing uh, the restricted fund as well, including after-school programs of both, or just, or just the general fund? Yes, we'll be looking at both restricted and unrestricted dollars. And uh, and thank you for a live live stream in the meetings. I've I've been getting compliments from from a lot of people about that. Um, 
Well, there was a discussion, I think, at one of our, the previous time this came up. Can we get, will there be a chance, and I'm sorry if you mentioned it, it's late. Will there be a chance where we get some review, so like a progress report, or some, rather than just comes, the final report comes and that's it? Like can, is, can, is there some place where we can build in some update along the way? I mean, I will be paying attention, and I'll be in touch with some of them, but it would be cool. And maybe if there could be some presentation here, even. Or maybe this is it and this will continue. Yeah, this will be on every single board meeting as a standing agenda item going forward and I'll report out the progress of the team unless you'd like a different format and would like me to ask the sustainable budget team members to report. We just felt that that might be a lot of Wednesdays for them. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I think we need to be considerate and also of their time and their commitment there already and I think that um, both you and our CBO can handle presenting us with reports, and the reports should be coming from the staff anyways, not the community members. Um, so, <coughs> Trustee Bilano scow anything else? Trustee Dr. Holm? Trustee Vice President Soto? Nothing else? Okay, seeing nothing else, thank you, um, both of you, for your <laughs> dedication, I mean. Every Wednesday. <laughs> wow. Um, you two are troopers, so thank you. Jenny, thank you, Dr. Contreras, for all your work you're doing with this. Um, I, I do believe it's a very important part of um, the, it was something that came from this board that we really wanted um, to get that input from these stakeholder groups. So going into having some hard conversations. So I think you're, we're made, we made a right decision in that direction and I'm glad that you two are super supportive of that and I also am hearing the feedback that you two really believe in this so you know you're not just taking marching orders from the board so appreciate both of you thank you all right so then now I will move us on to 13.3 appointment in terms of commission members personnel commission merit rule 13.1 this report will be presented by our director of classified personnel Ms. Shanks and I'm sorry you're here so late <laughs> authority is and whether or not that commissioner will accept reappointment. Uh, commissioner Torres um, has served as the commissioner's joint appointee for the last year, completing the previous uh, term of the previous commissioner. Uh, her term will expire on December 1st this year, um, and Ms. Torres has agreed to serve another three-year term. Um, at the September commission meeting, uh, commissioners Griffin and Murillo made a motion to announce Ms. Torres' reappointment as the joint appointee. Um, there will be a public hearing at the November Commission meeting, at which point the commissioners may appoint Ms. Torres uh, with the term to begin in December. Um, so this, this item is just for information this evening. There's no action needed by the board. Thank you, Ms. Shanks. Do we have any public speakers this item? We do not. All right. Seeing none, I will bring it back to the board for questions, comments, deliberation. Any deliberation from the board on this item? Thank you, Ms. Shanks. I am so sorry. <laughs> or we could keep you here for longer. We're on deck till 1.30. <laughs> She's running. <laughs> Thank you. All right. So that will now move us to 15.1. Our next regular board meeting is on Wednesday, October 9th, 2024, here in the City Council Chambers. And I am going to adjourn this meeting at 10.58 p.m.